Crash Course Podcast. As every week, I'm Matt. I'm John. I'm Steve. And we have a guest this week. It's our newest writer to the site, Tony. Um, thank you for coming on the show, Tony. We it's appreciate having you. Um, he's coming to us from the far off land of New Paltz. That I am. Well, and we, hence from the far off land of, of Long Island and soon to be perhaps one day the far off land of Milwaukee. You travel a lot. I don't intend to. It just happens. I see. Before we get into Tony a bit and his pick for this week, since he's our guest, he's brought us an album, whether we like it or not. Um, I have something that I want to talk about a little bit. Um, I, for, on Valentine's Day, my fiancé got me tickets to see a new show called Hamilton. It's based on Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr and their story. Um, and it's done by... The, the creator's name is Lin-Manuel Miranda. He had done In the Heights. Um, he's well known for his hip-hop, his rap influences. And this was a complete musical, all done in hip-hop and R&B. There was no speaking. It was all in prose of some kind to some beat. Um, it was fantastically done. And it tells about their feud, the two of them. Yep. And from the start. The uh, yep. From what starts when he first comes as an immigrant and first meets Burr to ending in that famous duel. Interesting. Yeah. I know they actually have the monument somewhere out in New Jersey in the in the the ground, the original dueling grounds, where mm -hmm. it wasn't just the two of them. It was like the sanctioned dueling grounds where anybody back in the day could just go and prove their honor. It was, it was actually an incredible musical for a lot of reasons, but for one, it, it seemed to push musical boundaries a lot because a lot of times when you have a musical and you don't involve any talking points, it's just all music from start to finish, you tend to lose a lot of the story. But because this was mostly done in hip-hop with a little bit of R&B, a lot of hip-hop is talking. So mm -hmm. even if there was music behind it or a rhythm behind it, you could still convey a lot of different emotions, moments, story without having to stop the music. Um, and it was a great show. I enjoyed it. Um, I got to meet the creator after the show. I chatted with him a bit. I also got to meet a couple of the cast members. Um, one of the cast members was actually on the same episode of Law & Order that my fiance Sarah was on, yeah. which was cool. So they awesome. had known each other. And it's just a really great story, too, because it's, it's nerdy in a different way. It's not, you know, video games or pop culture. It's history. It, it's told so specifically and intricately that... It's, it's clear that the creator is a fan of the history. And he just decided, I want to do a hip-hop musical about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And it shows. It, it's really easy to connect. There's funny parts. There's dramatic parts. It's overall a drama. But there are comedic moments with um, King George, where he'll come out on stage by himself. Was King George actually present? No, but well... At the event, I mean? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> not, not in the play, of course. But I mean, there were these moments in the play where the scene would clear... And King George would just walk out with a spotlight and sing a very forlorn R&B track, a come back to me kind of track, but actually detailing the things that the Americas went through and that he put them through. And so it adds this comedic element because he looks so somber and very begging, like, come back, but showing his insanity, too, since he lost his mind after he lost the colonies. That's true. And that would have been, I guess, right around the same time as uh, Burr and, and Hamilton were having the duel. So, so they broke up the drama with those comedic moments, which I thought was very clever. I, I have one question, and this goes back to an old uh, uh, commercial campaign. Did they end up having a got milk part? <laughs> no, they did not. No. If, if for anybody out there, look it up. It's one of the best commercials I remember from my childhood where uh, this guy phones in to a, a special radio station to try to win something, and he's, he's eating peanut butter. And, and the guy's like, well, well, who shot Hamilton? And, and the guy calls up, and he's like, it's Aaron Burr. He's like, what was that service? So, and it's, it's, just, it's just shot after shot of, like, the bullet, the gun, the wigs, or whatever they were wearing. And, and he's like, burr, 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 and he pours the milk out, and there's no milk out. And he's like, burr, 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 and they hung up on him. And it was so depressing. It was an amazing story. <laughs> Yay for obscure commercials. <laughs> <laughs> every YouTube time, no, every time YouTube they talk about this duel, I have to say, every time I talk about this duel, I go back to that commercial. So obviously it worked. That's fair. If it gets you, 
<laughs> in your history books. That's good. <laughs> but I, I wanted to bring up the show A because I loved it. I think it's one of the best musicals I've ever seen. It's just, it, it spoke to me a lot because I'm a huge fan of hip-hop, but also it's just the, the care in the history and in the scenery and in the building of the, uh, the musical. But also beyond that, it was, the cast was very talented. It's just, it seems like something that's destined for, to move from the public, this is at the public theater, by the way, to move from there to Broadway, which I'm hoping is its next step. But it's a fantastic show, and I advise everybody to go see it. I believe it's running till April 2nd. They got another extension. It's like the second or third extension they got. So go see it. It's definitely worth it. Well, if you're into hip-hop and I'm into history, why didn't you ask me to go back? <laughs> oh, because it was my gift for Valentine's Day, and I didn't buy the tickets. <sighs> Fine. Did you I get two? Runs. I, I also don't. Did you? No, no. Sarah bought us tickets for the two of us to go see this. So you got two tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying you got you got two tickets, and you didn't bring. St- I'm just pointing out you didn't bring Steve. I didn't That's get true. two tickets. Well, she bought you two tickets. No, she was... bought herself two tickets and took me for Valentine's Day. Oh, okay. Day. I thought okay. she just bought two tickets for you. No, but you're like, like, let, you, let me bring you, it. You could have. You had no. Her. She okay. just. Okay. I just okay. want to clarify that we got it. Okay. I don't love you, you Steve. You you love your fiance. I got it. Yeah, good. I'm glad you got that. I have a question. Sure. Did you at any point think? Like, this is funny, but not the way it's intended to be. Like, where you're like, this is completely absurd. Nope. The like, great you, thing you bought about, it entirely, like, I, I'm convinced. The great thing about the structure is the way the dialogues worked is it felt very natural, even when they spoke out of time. When they, they made, like, they were, they're drinking, they're, the first tavern scene, they mentioned drinking Sam Adams. Mm. Obviously, they weren't making Sam Adams back then, but it was a That's gag funny. within the rap. They're, the thing that I talked to Lynn Manuel about, who created it, is. When we were discussing it, he's like, you're the kind of audience that I'm really looking for, which is not everyone. You're the person who laughs at every joke. The stuff that's just funny because of context, funny because of what we're trying to convey, or funny because of the situation. You that know? sounds like you're the whore of comedy. <laughs> that sounds well, like no, that really the, was. The point is, I'm a nerd for history, music, and hip-hop specifically. That's who this is designed for, so he hit all those notes. It also keeps it broad. If you love one of the three, you'll probably go. You'll probably enjoy it. Yeah. So, of course. But but there was no moment where you're laughing because it's just so absurd. Yeah. The, the, it's so sincerely delivered and created, and there's so much heart in it, that you're really along for the ride, and those funny moments stand out from the drama. That makes sense. I'm just down for any unique and interesting new way of pursuing a medium, an yeah. existing medium, I think, and telling, yeah. a, telling a story and he's that done frankly this... doesn't get told that much. I mean, everybody yeah. just hears that as like a blurb in their history course. Like, oh yeah, all you just learned about Alexander Hamilton, yeah, he died in a Cute very odd way as well, far as modern And also something go. John will appreciate, because as I recall, John has mentioned that in Shakespeare, Iago is one of his favorite characters. Oh, yes. Aaron Burr is portrayed as an Iago. He's the narrator of the story, telling what everything happened, how everything happened, and giving point by point and stepping out of the scene. And that was really cool, too. Was he better than Keanu? Yes. Okay, then that's all I care about. This I mean, guy, but was, he, but was, he, better, be good. was this, he better than Kenneth Branagh? Uh, I, I, I have not seen Kenneth Branagh. Did not Branagh, see that so version. That's but version. but the guy playing Burr is a guy named Leslie Odom Jr. He's been in a lot of TV and a lot of movies doing, um, not minor parts, but he's he's been a good supporting role person. And he gets a lot of great music and great moments in this. And like, there's even one at the end where he says, even though I'm, there's a line that goes along the lines of, even in your history books, I'll be portrayed as the villain. And that's true, because he is more or less, even though he's not, it's not clear cut. Anyway, go see it. It's Hamilton. It's at the public theater. It's definitely worth checking out. Now, moving on, let's talk with Tony about his album choice and a little <laughs> bit about him. Obviously, you've, you've written at least one article for us already. You're yeah. a big music buff. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I am a freelance copywriter. I'm a guitar player. Uh, I'm a handsome guy. All of these things are true. Yeah, they're all true. <laughs> um, um, you recently either started a band or started promoting a band. I remember you sending me a link about it. Yes, that I did. Uh, it's like a funky, jammy, rocky trio, in- mainly instrumental thing. Its name, it, that's the important, the name is Valence. Valence, yes. V-A-L-E-N-S, like it's on Facebook. Um, but yeah, you know, it's good, it's fun. Well, I'd like to tell a little brief story here because, of course, uh, this is the, your first appearance on Crash Chords, and yet you're also a member of Crash Chords now. I am. And uh, a lot of this was due to uh, the, something that took place at the end of last year. And I, I've, I've, I've told this story a, a couple times before, I think, toward the end of, of a, a few podcasts, but it's more relevant now because uh, you're here discussing this. And 
the main reason you're here is, of course, to talk about music in the same capacity as we're talking about music. Uh, I remember it was on a mutual friend of ours we came across this this blog and thought we would just comment on it. And it had something to do with just this reference to a pop song and how it relates to music in a grand sense at the time. And it sparked this very interesting debate between you and a couple of other people. And I hopped in on it because it concerned, well, where does pop stand in the grand scheme of things? Where does all music stand in the grand scheme of things? And also, what are its merits? And how should you how should you rate its merits, if you're even rating at all? And I remember one of those things was the fact that... Uh, you were in, more in defense of all the individual aspects that pop can cover. For instance, you can theoretically learn something from pop that you might not be able to, uh, that someone else might scoff at. Someone else yeah. might say, might completely trash it and just call it, well, that's garbage. That's garbage as I see it. And that's generally not the way we've approached things here at Crash Chords. We try to go into any, everything with a fairly objective premise. And I think it's guided us pretty well, at least as far as 131 episodes of the podcast is concerned. Um, of course, we do have our flaws, and uh, I do want to address one of these flaws, because, after all, in the early days of the podcast, we did not go home and listen to the album over the course of the entire week. Back then, we just sat in the room, listened to it together, and, well, that was it, because we put a lot of value on first impressions. And one of these episodes goes back to episode 19, in which we reviewed Flying Lotuses Until the Quiet Comes. And I think it's very interesting, this whole little connectivity here as to the premise under which we brought you into Crash Chords, and you're now a, a resident writer, and now for today a resident panelist, and you decided to answer up that exact episode. We're going to try to do him a, some better justice today. Now, uh, first wait. of all... I, I yeah, don't don't let me in with you 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 two. Oh no, right? you, yeah, yeah, I didn't. You never, were I You weren't. You're here. innocent. It's completely I, the only podcast I missed was this episode. And you were replaced by Nelson Lugo, who claimed he had murdered you. Yes, That's I was notified them to the following That's true, week. <laughs> um, so so don't don't let me in. I will. No, you you were dead, and it got better. Yes, I got, I did get better. <laughs> Though I will say Great that I agreed sense. with most of the points that everybody made on that episode. Anyway. Sure, I'm not invalidating the episode, but I am invalidating the, the, the process and the structure under which we did it. Um, so, how come you brought it up, apart from that reason, which it's pretty good as far as interconnectivity and improving Crash Chords as a, as a, as a product, uh, what's your history with Flying Lotus? Um, I started listening to him, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago, and I kind of went through the whole, the whole nine, listened to all his music, and I liked it, you know? Uh, I, it's wonky and weird and jazzy, and I come from a jazz thing, so it's appealing to me on that level. And this album, it's just, I don't know, it's interesting to me because it's sort of a jazz fusion thing at parts, but not in a kind of corny way where people are like, oh no, jazz fusion, run for the hills, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I know as far as jazz fusion is concerned, people do tend to be very hesitant about certain, uh, certain processes that I guess just in general challenge the norm and I guess that's it that's it speaks to a pretty shallow society but it also sh speaks to a pretty a pretty realistic society yeah and, souls are, aren't in vogue today either if, for yeah. sure if someone hears a soul they're like oh yeah. god and then sometimes there's also uh the fact people pass off like fusions as as fleeting works of art the kinds of things that are just they're they're there and they're gone it was an experiment that was done once and once it was done well that's pretty much the end yeah. they don't treat that as if well that's an eternal art form they've started a new medium which can be followed upon and furthered and etc so yeah i i think it was pretty interesting to dip back into uh into this guy what is his actual name by the way uh steve ellison steve ellison who also goes by captain murphy and Captain Murphy as a rapper. Yes, and also Flying Lotus. So, yeah, this is going to be an interesting podcast. It's an interesting album because, of course, the fact this album concerns itself with very, very short exposés of, of musical material. We usually don't cover albums that look at songs so brief or pieces so brief. Typically, you get your average length. You get four minutes or so, maybe five minutes or so, or even longer if you're going to have it. We're actually more comfortable, perhaps, than with eight-minute-long, you know, monsters than we are one-minute-long uh, oddballs. I mean, in many of these Unless... cases, they're just, they're just snippets of material, but you have to look at the moment. Yeah, and so at, at times, it's almost like you're trying to tackle a series of interludes in just the concept of how they're used normally. 
Uh, a lot of times when you're getting a 30 second idea, a 45 second idea, or even a minute and a half long idea, you're still looking at it from the framework, well, it was bracketed by five minute, six minute song. So yeah. this, this album just banks on those 45 second ideas. Yeah. And we're going to go through these, of course, one by one, but uh, as, as part of a disclaimer, I suppose, to any, any listener out there who clicks on the Spotify play button and immerses themselves into this album, uh, it, it's, it's a question of, I guess, looking at the merits behind surrealism. It's not just the artist that we're looking at, it, it's the subject we're tackling, the merits of, of surrealistic pieces that may not follow the standard arc of a song. Because, of course, how much of an arc can you really tackle in the course of 45 seconds to, sure. to a minute? Um, and that is an arc... Uh, that kind of arc, that brief arc, as opposed to, let's say, classical storytelling. Um, I've often said that sometimes we look a bit too keenly at, I guess, classical linear motion, uh, even when we're, I guess, supposedly in what's cutting edge, like, alt territory. Usually we seem to be fundamentally searching for, like, classical structure. It could be said in many ways that, that rock has more in common with Beethoven's seventh than it does this. So... You know, yeah, that's fair. It's it's a claim of mine. I also want to keep in mind the fact that we've done other electronica recently, just as much as three episodes ago. We did Aphex Twin, in which we were also looking at sort of like impressionistic pieces, things that were just kind of trying to put you in a mood, even for transient periods of time, rather than immerse you into the overall story, which me and John still somehow found. But you know, I like something my to think about. There's there's that. I like yeah. my stories. So this record, of course, is called "You're Dead" with an exclamation point. So you know it's emphasized. Um, by Flying Lotus, as we had mentioned. Um, the first track is called Theme, so we're going to, like, you know, get right to it. Well, I'll get right to it. First of all, I'll just describe this track a little bit. This is formed of what I would call about three segments. Uh, for lack of a better description, I'm going to call this an intro, the action, and the culmination. I call the first track, I mean, the first part of this track, I think it, it begins with, like, all the power and the breadth of an overture, but... At least at first, it lacks the thematic qualities of an overture. Overtures tend to have a series of individual themes later fulfilled in the content, but in many ways, this opening is kind of primordial. It's just like like an orchestra tuning up prior to uh, prior to whatever they're gonna do. It's just whirring in the background. Hardly any hardly any variety. A little bit of rumble. It's almost. Um... Each little bit of sound is sort of canceling one another out, so you're getting just one bass line note going in the background that just ever so slightly dips and spikes as it's going along. Mm -hmm. It's very dense. It, it, it peaks quite a bit. It's it's you could put it in the same category as white noise almost. Um, the the little bit of variety we do get, I think, is just a, a couple of like chimes that usher it off to begin with. And if you if you peer through all that white noise, you do get this like dramatic tremolo. So it's kind of like it's a little bit like tuning, but at the same time, it's somewhere walking that line between being a piece itself. When I saw that it was called theme, I thought maybe it'd be like a melodic theme, and I'd be like, <laughs> oh, this is going to happen all the time in this album. But I think maybe it's more of a, like, here's a sample of what this album is going to sound like. Mm -hmm. It's going to sound like crazy, weirdo jazz fusion, at least a lot of times. Well, see, that's it. I mean, it's funny because I wouldn't get, I guess, interpret what we do get later on the album just from like this initial segment oh, but maybe from not, the, no. the 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 this next two segments the second yeah. and third segment uh it's a the transition like here that. yeah and then the transition is very 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 harsh because it i mean the only i guess uh transition instrument we get is the drums the drums seem to kind of like build they rumble in the background you get a lot of a lot of snare work a lot of just like bouncing off the um off the uh, the hi hats, that kind of thing, and then finally we do arrive at the second section, which gives us the exact j jazz fusion that you described. It's pretty bizarre. It's it's comprised of lots of meter changes, um, oddball it's, instrumentation. We've completely um, like thrown the palette here. It's 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 the manic machinations of a jazz guy having a seizure or something like that. <laughs> it's just all over the scale going on here. It's. Uh, cacophony is the most appropriate adjective I can think for this because it's just little tidbits uh, into the inside of what they're they're trying to portray of what uh, Flying Lotus is trying to portray with this album. In hindsight, just little like breakthroughs through through the the, the cellophane on this album is, is is being pushed through right here. It's an interesting little bit, but still, it's not gripping for me. I feel like it's more, it's inappropriately named as theme defined by what we take as theme. Like what Tony thought it might mean. 
it would be better named as introduction or intro because yeah. it really is. It's an introduction to the record, and even by the second part of it, you're really getting a sense of what's to come, but not in a thematic overture kind of way. It's just, you know, dabbling, and that's why I think that cacophony kind of descriptor also really works because he does that a lot. He, he tends to grab at a lot of things in moments to make a lot of noise, for I better mean, or for worse. We get little bits of thematic material, I think what you could call recurring mat- thematic material just in that second section. Uh, for instance, apart from like the whole mood changing, suddenly we go from like this foreboding intro, and now all of a sudden it's like goofy. It's quir- if, if you were going to describe that that jazz fusion work, I I throw in the word avant garde a little bit, but again, it's 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 more rigid than that. It's not that loose. It does have a pattern that it returns to. Um, I, I actually the one thing it did remind me of was the kind of musical asides that you would expect from from a Yes album, or especially a Yes. Uh, um, a yes, live. I never thought material. of that, but yeah, no, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm on board with that. I really even, am even on board the, even with the that. instrumentation. That's what I meant by like it, how it changes over the whole palette. There, I mean, you no longer have an orchestra. All of a sudden, it's mm. using like prog oriented instruments. It's, it's a lot of keyboard work, and even some of that keyboard work kind of sounds like it's a little bit, kind of get the sense of the mellotron a little bit. So it, it's it's a pretty oddball shift. And also, we need to go to the the third and and final shift on this album, excuse me, the second shift, which brings us to the third section, and all of a sudden there, we step back a notch. We were, were, proc- we were practically in the second section for no more than maybe like like 14 seconds. Like, th- this is how brief of a, of a time period that we're referring to. And then finally, we take it back a notch, and now it's like jazz noir. Now it's open. Now all of a sudden, it, it's like it, it took its breath. It took its very, very deep breath. Everything is very, very dense in that second section. Now all of a sudden, it's just releasing. Well, I think the reason for that after the fact now that I can point out is because of what the second track does. The fact that that end part is designed to kind of breathe right into the next song. Before knowing that, just listening to this song as itself, it did seem a little odd. But connecting to track two, Tesla, when we get to that, I think it really does connect very well because it has that jazzy kind of feel. It has a jazzy kind of feel, and I'd also think that in many ways the theme did come a little bit full circle because it went from chaos to a maybe full circle is not the way to put it maybe it it's more like primordial to chaos to, to composed to, i would call it beautified chaos i think that's really more what i meant by by full circle because the beginning you can't call it beauty at all but then finally when it comes to the end it it really starts to open up it starts yeah. to like tuck at the heartstrings just a little bit toward the tail end here so it became something tangible something emotional something you can actually like access as opposed to you know noise white noise slathered on uh this isn't necessarily a direct response to that but something in general that i think is important on the whole thing is the fact that he's a a producer but in the sense that he makes electronic music Mm -hmm. but on this album there's you know three drummers three keyboard players one of whom is herbie hancock saxophone player all these instrumentalists Mm -hmm. but he's and he does a lot of sampling so it's almost like he has a live band and he's using them as samples at times, I find. Or it's almost like he's like a band director. So, But you'll hear him how it's basically just an instrumental, you know, jazz jam for all intents and purposes. But near the end of the track, like, he kind of makes the saxophone quiet and, like, kind of swell up. Yeah. And it's those little touches that take it from, like, oh, this is a jazz thing to, like, oh, this is kind of a sound scapey, I don't know. See, I would agree with that almost 100% if it wasn't for the fact that it, of course... He's a band director in post. You know, yeah, most of the sure. stuff is... Who knows what they were doing in the original raw cut? Yeah. I mean, that it's it's something that could kind of... You could be dreaming of it. I mean, you'd probably still never know the exact mm-hmm. answer. A lot of these processes, and we certainly encountered this with, with Aphex Twin and his sort of self-proclaimed uh, erratic design, how each and every track was just named like a series of numbers, you know, booga booga mix or something <laughs> like that. It's it, it literally is just like pulled from his head and then reorganized however the hell his head works. And yeah. that's the way it works with these, you know, single focused uh, uh, producers, musicians, electronic musicians, and so forth. So from there we'll go into track two, Tesla. Um, this definitely refines it as far as i found it 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 takes that that structure and as you were saying this matter how it kind of pulls up pulls out everything from that jazz fusion and that that chill noir and it takes it to a logical next step which is something that's a little bit more structured um still jazz 
but smoother, kind of nightclub oriented, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I would even hesitate to say jazz fusion here and just call it straight up jazz. Well, I got a real sense of that kind of nightclub feel between the jazzy bass intro and then the snare drum that had tapping on it. And the snare drum was either being tapped with drumsticks or brushes. But either way, it had this kind of groovy kind of tap, which I really liked and gave that atmosphere. What the the most distinct piece for me though, especially in the early parts of of the track, is the guitar. That's the melody and yeah. the solo work of that guitar. The very distinct nature, and I I I will point out the picking here is phenomenal. If this was done like straight up, not in post, I am very impressed with the guitarist oh, here. Yeah, no, this it's, this seems... it's, it's it seems too fluid to. Uh, quick, really, to be, to have been done in post. It's it's just yeah. too natural sounding, which considering a little bit of my preconceived notions and also just what happened in theme, uh, very refreshing. Nice little like reintroduction of the album for me. Um, great texture going on here. I love the way things are now starting to be built layer by layer, piece by piece. Well, of course, it's more accessible because of the fact that it is, you know, in pretty untreated guitar, as far as I can discern. Um, and, you know, that that's refreshing, I guess, after you hear a lot of a lot of slurps and sloops that you would get from, like, <laughs> reversing the, the, the track and so forth. Are those the technical terms? Yes, Steve? There, those are there technical terms. I, I, I took that straight from, straight from the academia. No, wait. I've never seen a slurp dial though on a uh, actual music station. Oh, it's there. You know the big boys. You got to find it. It's not always labeled. Oh, okay. Sometimes right, it's you. just under one of the channels. Very big oh, boards. okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, there's other things, of course, because the fact that it is a straightforward melody, and there's not a lot of like straightforward melodic material on this album. Again, it's a lot of impressions here and there. But it still has Secondly, its character, though, because yeah. there are odd, those odd notes and those little distortions throughout it that give it this kind of character that's distinctly Flying Lotus. Mm-hmm. And then also the other thing is it's, it's got a key. It's got a straightforward key. There's no, like, you know, back and forth thing here. It's uh, out over that opening guitar pattern. You know, you get those first three chords. They have sort of this, like, chromatic side sidestepping that finally delivers us at a major. So it's kind of like this surprise impression of home. So once you arrive there, it's like, ah, that's the most satisfying point yet that we've had as far as this, this track and a few seconds goes. Um, but, of course, we don't stay there because then once it moves forward... I think we get like the a few signif- significant uh, motifs that that guitar uh, returns to, and then after it, it kind of derails and does go off on a more freestyle pattern. It's still a straight guitar, but it starts to kind of lose its 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 arc after a while. Yeah, I because uh, I didn't I don't necessarily I mean there is a you know a melody here and there with the guitar, but I don't necessarily agree that it really is that strong of a thing. Like, I wasn't like, oh, yeah. look, a motif. Because I feel like 90% of the it's song is brief. just a bass solo. Yeah. And, you know, it makes sense, because this is the song that has Herbie Hancock, so if you have a great bass player and Herbie Hancock in a studio, you're probably going to be like, hey, maybe you guys should just go off. Yeah, it, it was... It's even hard to even describe what that... that, that motif was and when i say motif it's literally like twice that it recurs that's it it's just something (laughs) yeah it's something and i remember like the second time it recurred it went up a fourth but eh, it was it was it was pleasing and it was the only anchored moment so far and that's why i want to point out it it did not feel a hundred percent just jazz jazz as i know it jazz as you may know it or, or jazz as somebody who knows jazz a lot better than i do it felt more along the lines of what just like the masses might think of when you hear the word jazz, just a stereotypical jam session idea, which is not the forefront of what the the actual genre is. It's 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 an it's not a bad idea by no stretch. Was it really that derailing or disappointing? But it felt like well, let's just have fun and call it and and in the jazz realm instead of having. That structure. If I by needed have, that if structure. By, by have fun, you mean like let's slowly unwind and lose our let's, minds. Let's as the jam. Track is on. Yeah, yeah, but I I need that structure because those little tidbits of the melody, the guitar, I latched onto that. When that melody was lacking, it really did feel like the whole song was starting to take a dip. Well, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as jam session. I think it's tighter than that. But I get where you're coming from. Uh, there's a couple other things I need to notice, but also goes back to an earlier thing that you were mentioning, and that was texture. Uh, a big 
proponent here is even aside from the guitar itself was uh the drums the drums were spectacular here i think that that they function in kind of an odd way. They're the driving force in this track, but they're not as erratic as we got in the first track. Instead, they stay, they play more like a stop-motion film. It's it's a little bit less rich and colorful as the previous track, but it keeps the action moving, such that maybe you're not as aware of the fact that that the guitar is kind of just like rambling on after a few seconds, but instead you're just you're lost in the motion of it. And that's what I... No, they were cool. I they kind stayed of, calm. They stayed within a very... Uh, quality realm, a very tight realm that did keep it from completely derailing, that did keep this song as as Tesla, as one solid piece for me. It's just, but as just the percussion level, it wasn't enough to keep all the other brickwork from starting to crumble around it. True, but then we also have to look at the tail end of the song, and that's the fact that, um, or piece rather, there's no lyrics yet, but um, it starts to kind of unwind after a while. And by unwind, I don't mean the fact that the guitar is going off. We already mentioned that. There is a point in which the drums finally fall out. So it's like the bottom just fell out in this, in this track. And now, all of a sudden, we're in, in darker territory. The keyboard comping steps in, and it, it, it's, it's very thin now. All of a sudden, the drums, they just start these, these, these periodic swells. And then that recurring motif on the keyboard, which, again, only occurred at the same time as those drum swells, was so sparse and so so alluring, but in, in its, like, nightclub noir setting, that it reminded me very much of another thing that I frequently reference in this podcast because of how influential it was to Electronica, and that was Vangelis' uh, 1977 album, 0. 0.3, Albedo 0. 0.39, which... I even could could isolate the moment, and that was in the third track called Mare Tranquillitatis or something like that. And it's it's one of those, like, eight- to nine-minute monstrosities by contrast to all of this. But toward the end, it starts unwinding in very much the same exact fashion. It just... It's chaos. It's chaos for, like, seven minutes, and then all of a sudden, it just starts chilling out. Like it had to take a breather at some point. And that's exactly what this track do- did, and, and in many cases, in many ways, it's also what the first track did. So I have this feeling that he kind of likes to reach these, like, in his sense, orgasmic climaxes before finally just chilling. He likes that, he, especially like on those ninth chords, he loved chilling on that too. Um, I think, I think to keep in mind with the whole, you know, a lot of this is so kind of crazy and almost free jazzy, mm-hmm. is he's the great nephew of Alice Coltrane and John Coltrane. And John oh, no Col- way. Yeah, and John Coltrane obviously being John Coltrane, who did a lot of, you know, pretty out there stuff, mm-hmm. and I'm sure he has engaged with that pretty directly. So I'm sure, you know, he feels some sort of obligation, I bet, to contribute to that medium in some way. Yeah, or possibly, uh, yeah. Kinship? Uh, kinship blood by blood. Oh, yeah, he continues sure, the sure. tradition. And he's apparently super close to his great aunt and stuff, so... You know that was even another uh, as far as the descriptor goes. I, I referred to it as as jazz space noir outro. <laughs> it's, it's one way. I to would put love it. to hear that album. Well, actually, we kind of did in Shikaria's The Vigil back in episode fifty-seven. A little bit here that, and yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, but I want that macro album. That's true. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go on to track three, Cold Dead. We get something a little bit different here. This from the moment it starts feels like almost like an acid rock kind of fusion. It was very heavy and loud. Um you said that Brendan Small was featured on this track, right? Is that correct? I actually have to say there's two guitars on this album, so now I'm not really sure which okay. one is him. Brendan Small right. is fe- featured somewhere on here. For those who don't know, Brendan Small, of course, is a famous comedian and musician. He is responsible for all of the music for um um, Metalocalypse and Death Clock. He <laughs> writes all of it. I think he has other musicians perform it with him, but he does all of the writing for that. So he's a very much a very heavy guitarist. Um, but yeah, the minute the song starts, it's like a wall of guitar. And my problem with this song, especially from the moment it started, is as much as I liked what the guitar was doing, there was so much other noise on top of it that it just kind of overwhelmed me. It wasn't necessarily bad. It just it wasn't for me. It kind of pushed me back. Well, the the guitar. And I think that you might be, just in my opinion, going a little bit too much in one direction because it didn't quite feel metal or that kind of a no, level. It, it felt more feel metal. prog. It didn't feel metal. I just mentioned a metal guitarist. Okay, I wanted to make I wanted to make that distinction. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. I'd go prog, uh, but I'd even hesitate to really put like a genre on this. I would just no, describe just... it for what it is, which is like it, 
as far as the texture change, it's pretty significant from the previous track, and he goes to more of a distorted guitar pattern that kind of, like, rises chromatically, and then repeats that a few times, gets you in that groove, like, up a half step, up a half step, and then, finally, the culmination. And this is the important moment for this track, because it builds to this very, very rich G minor ninth chord, filled out in the upper partials by saxophones. And that's important, because, again, that, that connects with the whole jazz noir feel, but at the same time, it's like the majority of this track this time is that outro, the little brief outros that we've been getting in the previous two tracks. Now, all of a sudden, it it really has built up into the majority of the product here. And it's weird if that's your culminating point and you just stick with it, but I was appreciative of that because it's been my favorite part of this album so far. But, but, the, uh, the combination in the beginning with those frantic percussion pieces, to lose it when it goes into that... That really sweet uh, sax solo work, the or sort of solo work. Well, that's even later. That, that it, chi- it takes its time, part, slowly chilling. <laughs> the before that, the, the the changes in the 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 color wheel he's working with here are are really abrupt and and a little distracting. In fact, maybe more than a little distraction. The transitions are just not palpable at times in this song. It's it's hard to stay on board when you're doing something that's really heavy and to just kill it, but not kill it in such a way where it feels like a burn, where it feels like you're literally cutting off something. It's just not there for me. I think that might be intentional, though, to make it abrupt and almost uncomfortable. Oh, no, I would definitely agree that it's probably in- intentional. I guess I'd, how could it not be? Yeah, but I would argue that... <laughs> the ironic thing is that I'm kind of like on the opposite side here. I thought that everything in this track felt so much more natural, I guess, than you guys did. Which, you know, just speaks to how people interpret things differently. But um, it, I found that actually prior to that whole little chill breakdown that you're talking about, where it's just the saxophone solo on its own thing, um, like, the transitions here, again, are kind of in, in terms of three parts. There's that really, like, heavy, distorted pattern in the beginning... I guess that was the harshest transition yet as it went to the next section, which was more of a smooth, chill, like 6-8 groove. It's this, you get this very sexy walking bass right at that time. And that brings the time signature to light because, again, you did, I think it was even in 6-8 in the very beginning, but you barely sense it because you don't really have that driving force, and that is the bass here, doing the walking bass on each beat of the 6. So I, I thought that that was something, like, again, you can kind of you can grab onto. I don't. I didn't find that to be very jarring, at, in the least. And then the final uh, transition, in which it finally just gets a little bit softer and breaks down. That way, I, it, it occurred over over a longer span of time, and so therefore I didn't find it jarring. It, it, unless you just see the, the the silence that eventually comes as as, as jarring, and the, maybe the, the the saxophone ramble is jarring. But again, everything was gradually introduced here, so I guess I don't see it in the same light. My my big issue, though, I think with that, the way I see it is I don't want to have to reappreciate the track itself. I don't want to have to start all over to start picking out what I'd like about it sectionally. I wanted something a little more broad, a through line, so that I can see the context of each part in a more distinct or f- more firm manner. I'll give you that, but then if... If we're going to go with my vision of looking at this track in three different parts, then I'll say two out of three, I, I don't think that would apply to. The second to the third, I the think, was far more was gradual. Better. But I it's maybe, that first I to maybe, second that was, that was pretty jarring and was hard to wrap my head around. I would cut out the beginning, I agree. I think that was, that was a little bit of a throw around. And again, that's part of the, being the electronic musician. When you're just doing this stuff in post, you might have slapped an idea together <clears> that maybe didn't even start from the same concept. So it's very possible. And I don't know, we have to leave that... We have to leave that open. And it sounds very separated. So, yeah. Anyone else? Anything else to say on this track? I think I'm good to move on to track four. All right. Um, Fucking dead. F-K-N dead. Um, this was a very, very short track, only 40 seconds long. But, I mean, it was short but sweet. I kind of enjoyed what he did with it. I honestly, it's the first time on the record I went, oh, oh, wait. Where's the rest? Well, you got an iconic electric guitar kind of a piece going on here, which... One of those things that it has like pre-built hooks in it. You have really nice jumpy percussion going along with it. It's a decent enough starting idea, but I think it dies a little bit too early. I, this, I could have said, go for it. Go along with this. This would have been a great 
even three minute track. I think though it is supposed to play a part as an intro to the next track too, and I think that's why it was so short because it it does fit fairly well with what the next track goes into. Uh, I think it's also sort of a well, yeah, no, right off of that, it's kind of a buffer because to me the first three songs are kind of like a here are, here's this band, let's have this band play this kind of music. Yeah, I mean, well, I also have to consider texture here, and that's the fact that, I don't know, no one has mentioned even the entire time that we're talking about, like, R&B and soul here, practically. Yeah. Uh, that's what I heard from this right off the bat. Well, that, and I, it reminded me of the stuff we did, like, back in Black Messiah, which was just two episodes ago. That's um, uh, that's definitely uh, that electric guitar built-in hook. I, I would equate it sure. to that kind of a soul feel that we're going for. Um, well, yeah, and I think, but that's also why, I mean, I said that without saying that, that's why I feel so connected to the next track, because it has those, this track has those roots in R&B. Sure. And, I mean, also the fact that we're dealing with kind of like, like just intervals here, it's, it's and simple patterns, simple patterns that I think just support this as, as like, uh, what would you call them, oh, to electron, they're just like loops practically. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's worth like really immersing into, at the same time, I think it, it. You're right. It functions as a good precursor to the next track because of the fact that it kind of just shifts down and disperses into a haze, and then finally, oh well, oh, it was track five, and you barely even noticed it. Um, I was at this point going to make some stupid joke about how we'll spend twice as much time talking about the song as its length, but then I realized we do that with every song, so it doesn't really matter. I, w- for, I would just set that aside I yeah. regarding this album. Yeah. I believe we had a 30-minute. Uh, song that only had about a five minute discussion back in Swan. It's there probably also true. You, the, it's it's the it's the piece that proves the rule. <laughs> uh, right. Um, going into the next track, Never Catch Me. So Never Catch Me is featuring Kendrick Lamar, who is obviously w- very well known. He's he does a lot of great hip hop work, um, and he does a lot of spoken poetry too. And what I really like about his work is, especially on this track, is it starts with a very sweet piano intro. And then it goes pretty much into a really great hip hop uh, track with him rapping over it, and I, I had this moment of ooh, a song. Even hey, fr- even from the very beginning, it's it's a it's a piano intro playing along a soul riff. So yeah. even from the second it starts, I, I and especially because the last track was still kind of in that R and B soul territory, I was like, okay, well he's here now. I just yeah. accepted it, I guess, for a track now. But um, I don't know. It was a little bit elusive, especially for. Being the first track on the album, I found it to be a little bit, eh, okay. I think we're in darker territory, but it's a rap that is supported by something that is very, very signature Flying Lotus, and that is those little warbles in the background. That's just something that I've heard him do on the last album, Until the Quiet Comes. I've heard it so far here. Uh, so I don't really feel like we've left his uh, his expertise, per se. No, not at it's all. Not like no, shifted. he's just... This he's his expertise. Yeah. He's yeah. now added on... A, a uh, the layer of coffee shop beat poetry on top of it. That's sure. it, it. It has lyrically, it has more in common with that just from looking at the words than it does in a more hip hop orientation. That's I, I was looking at it before, and I was actually kind of surprised. I was like, "Wow, he's just kind of talking about." I don't know. He's just philosophizing. Oh, yeah, go to this. endlessly. I can see the darkness in me, and it's quite amazing. Life and death is no mystery, and I want to taste it. Step inside my mind and you'll find curiosity, animosity, high philosophy, like the prophesized mediation. Like come on, that's the prop- like that. there you go, there you go. I mean, come on, you can see, you can hear the bongos at some points, you can smell the clove cigarettes. There it is. Like the prophesied meditation. And, I mean, there's a lot of this that is just... I, I feel it's time to kind of mention the thing that was brought up that is pretty important to this album, because Tony brought it up, and that's the fact that this album was, was I guess, labeled by him as, as a day, a, con, a, a, a conceptual approach to death. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't entirely hear it myself. I mean, when there's lyrics, yeah, naturally, because they're well, and also, like, me, but... This, this idea of never catch me is like, death will never catch me, you know, I'm just yeah. living my life and moving on and going through. I mean, yeah, it's... He, but if the artist says, this is the concept, I guess you can't really argue, even if you no. don't hear it. If they say it's the concept, then that's their concept, yeah. which well, I think is also kind of a bold thing to do. I mean, from the beginning of the album up till here, I think we've we've heard dark themes here and there, but I wouldn't have been like, oh, that's death. You hear something yeah. dark and you immediately go there. No, it's... But you get it here in lyrics even further on. You have... 
Lyrics like, analyze my demise. I say I'm super anxious. Recognize I deprive this fear and then embrace it. Vandalizing these walls only if they could talk. Conversations don't contemplate to my dark thoughts. Looking down on my soul now. Tell me I'm in control now. Tell me I can live long and I can live wrong. And I can live right. All this is so imminent. So just, like, heavy. It's, it's, he's con it's an existential crisis in some sense. But, it, I mean... I don't, I don't know. I, I want to... It's an odd point for this for this album to suddenly get this dark. Because, again, up until now, it it had moments that were kind of goofy and circusy, And now all of a sudden we've just gotten this real. So. I mean, but it, when an album takes a dark turn like that, it's not uncommon for it no. to be out of nowhere. So. No, it's, it's, it's more just, you know, you, you'd think it would be more defined from the get-go. You, you think it would have been more apparent. I mean, you know, you did mention, I, I, I forget where, Tony, but you mentioned that in one of these tracks, you heard something tantamount to a funeral dirge. But I think that was even after we had brought up the concept yeah. of it being death. So now all of a sudden, oh, it's in our heads. And now we're looking for it every single place. But I don't think it would have been anywhere if it hadn't been mentioned. But yet now we have to perceive the album as such. Well, I don't think there's um, anything wrong with that per se. Yeah. Uh, but then again, we should remember the title, which is called You're Dead. Yeah. That, that's kind of important. Yeah, I guess you don't even really need to be told in some senses. True. Yeah. Why, why is he telling us we're dead? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we pull things from the album cover, although this time it just oh, yeah. seems to be him uh, with his face all blotted out, pulling various different, like, impressions of things from the ether. I think what might maybe shed a little bit of light on the whole death thing is he's sort of into, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like, you know, very spiritualism. He's not so much of like a traditional Christian take on it. I think right. he's taking from maybe Eastern things, and it, yeah. you get an Eastern gist from and the album so color. For sure. I think when you think of that kind of stuff, and that's where he's coming from, and then you listen to the music, it makes more sense because it kind of has that kind of uh, spacey, astral projectiony whatever. Well, this track kind of has that feel. I mean, later yeah, on in sure. the track, during the whatever you want to call it, breakdown, interlude, bridge, I don't know, this long moment without lyrics and instrumentations, you get that kind of ethereal feel. Yeah. So it's definitely supported by the music, even in this song. And it's like also the fourth time we've mentioned that exact same transition. So, yeah. you know, it has been done and we get it here. But I would also argue that this track is a lot more is a lot more unified and, yes. and digestible just from a sing-song, again, what I was referring to earlier is like the, the classical storytelling progression. Uh, we do get a legitimate solo. It's not just like a ramble, you know, where someone just went off. In this case, it's like a lightning fast guitar solo, and it's very regular, just staying on 16th notes. Lots of doubling, though. Lots of little, like, you know, repeat the note over oh, and that, over so you get I that. I love that wicked, that, that, that wicked yeah. idea in that guitar solo. That was a highlight of this track for me. I really <laughs> love that, and... Frankly, I kept going back to the bass. That was the one through line throughout the whole song that really just showed its backbone. Um, I noted as much. It wasn't. It was always present, but never overstated. It was just a background noise at times, up to a, a true like major component that stuck with me here. I love what they're doing with the bass. I love everything, really, that is bass oriented so far on this album, and really throughout the whole album itself. That's that's something I got to touch on right now. That's a good that point. That instrument is just awesome throughout. I'll, oh, yeah. I'll also bring up uh, one other thing here, and if we're going to perceive this track as kind of in kind of the, a, a darker light, I'll I'll say it's disturbing for a couple of reasons. Aside again from previous instances of tracks that just derailed, and that's why it's unsettling. Here it's 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 disturbing because of like a lot of the harsh intervals in in the synth work. And then also, toward the end, this persistent slide whistle that, that is in the background really? over everything else. It, it, it sounds like a slide whistle. Yeah, it's man. just this, like, you're, like, up and down, up and down in the background. And you can't, you, after a while, you couldn't unhear it, in, in, except for you who didn't hear it. Yeah, so, I don't, I don't know. I, I noted it, and I thought it was a little bit bizarre. But especially considering you're, you're doing this over, over lyrics here. So... And you even have a chorus. The, the chorus ultimately is, say you will never catch me. No, no, no. Say you will never catch me. No, no, no. And I believe that that, that slide whistle might have been present during that. But I don't know. I wasn't Strangely enough, I wasn't as big on this song as I was other tracks on this album. Only because, ironically enough, maybe the presence of 
structure bored me a little bit in lieu of what he was doing. I guess. I don't know. I enjoyed the structure also because it was reminiscent of another musician I enjoy, Bus Driver, who does a very similar kind of style of music with rapping. Mm. And so it was reminiscent of another thing I like, so I kind of liked it. Um, Well, it did have a pretty uh, grand outro. That, that, like, sort of... Uh, very electronic sounding uh, triad work in the outro that was very very um, it was peaking quite a bit it was it seemed to be the most culminating point for this this track but I don't know I dug it I just I don't know if I I don't know if I like the song as a whole I don't know if I I, I could feel it justified for some reason I don't know um, I part of why I like it is just because of the fact that it exists like because he's <laughs> been doing you know all this stuff for so long and he's been getting a lot of recognition, but, you know, Kendrick Lamar's obviously pretty gigantic. You know, some people think he's, like, the messiah of hip-hop. <laughs> and I think it's cool that he's actually doing... He's, you know, has the potential to be noticed. And that he's still staying true to what he does with, you know, this crazy bass solo at the end and stuff like that. It struck me as interesting that he got Kendrick Lamar and, you said, Herbie Hancock and all of these other musicians. I didn't realize, I guess, originally that Flying Lotus was that big in the business. And this is even well, further considering proven. what we found out his parentage is, sort yeah, of. Yeah. You know, it's not actually Well, that's surprising. lineage. Not a, well, lineage, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> Just, um, not everybody follows the uh, the pattern of their... Or, or connects it to other greats in the industry. But it is still further as his ability to, uh, uh, to network in the next track. Track 6, De- Dead Man's Tetris... Featuring, well, Captain Murphy is him, but predominantly Snoop Dogg. So, when you mentioned the last track had bizarre moments, I scoffed only because this track was fucking weird. Oh, I didn't say the last track had bizarre moments. I mean, maybe moments, but right. not as a track. This yeah. track was ridiculous. It was just so bizarre and cluttered and aggressive, and yet... Fascinating, and yet yes. fascinating, yet hypnotic at the same time. I don't know that I hated it. I'm not sure how I feel about I it. I had a very it. odd moment with it. But, like, there are even moments later, like in the midpoint of the song, when once um, Snoop Dogg starts rapping, which comes much later, it the music feels almost circular, like this whirlwind of sound coming at you. And it doesn't really relent at all. It was just very odd to me. Also, the name Dead Man's Tetris. I mean, obviously a reference to the game Tetris, or just a reference to a game in general is just kind of odd for me. Well, aside from the use of the sound effects themselves, which does kind of ring of Tetris, yeah, the music itself, it's, it's, it's not a... Sound. Exactly, but the music itself is not... It's not like an homage. It's yeah. not a... It's not pulled from the main theme, really. It's it's pretty dissimilar. I will say one thing, though. This track, more than anything else, and this is actually taking away from... I, I, I won't even count the vocals in this point... It felt like a creepy pasta version of Tetris. <laughs> like if you were playing like Mario.exe or something like that, like one of those really weird spin off ROMs. You're watching too much Markiplier. No, uh, be quiet with it. <laughs> shush, shush, I love Mark. So do I. Uh, like a creepy hack or something. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it had that vibe because there was enough of that 8 bit feel to it. Yeah. It was recognizable at parts. I played a lot of tre- Tetris over the years. Still have it on my computer, and I still have my original Game Boy with that cartridge. I'd argue it's I, the sounds, though, not the melody, not the, not no, the content. No, but it's that it's those sounds which uh, sound almost purposely sampled from the original games that I immediately identified. But that, coupled with everything that was brought to it, really did make it frighteningly scary at points, especially the pauses where it goes really 8-bit on us, where it sounds like someone ripped out a cartridge out of a Nintendo without shutting the game off first. Everything goes haywire. Those little tidbits really did a great job of cementing the theme of this track more than anything else up until this song. I think it's also about... It's about the rhythm of this. And it's not that the rhythm is doing anything particularly bizarre, but just about how... how a little bit stifled it is in certain moments, and it takes it down really, really chill. But of course, you have Snoop Dogg here, and he's probably the most chill man alive, um, at least in, at least as far as his vocal quality is concerned. Um, but the funny thing is, when it was a little bit more uh, sporadic, it, it, I found that it actually like had the capacity to get me on a dance floor in a hip hop setting, and that says a lot. It says a real lot because normally I, I just wouldn't dig this, but there's something about the groove here which is just so entrancing. And uh, as far as the, as far as just the beginning of this track is concerned, suddenly we're in C major. I think that also is another thing that's subliminally in our heads that we've gone from all of these like like 
harsh intervals and and oddball we've gone from chord to chord and now finally which is c major just it opened us up in in this uh kind of pleasant setting um if it wasn't for the rhythm kind of taking us off off the wall and the bass specifically quite kookily just like takes us down in these seesawing thirds down to e minor and it hammers that out like every other beat while the vocals recite and this is where it really kind of like clenches everything up hold up hold up why do you make us think you're dead and again very very smooth very steady and it's 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 very few instruments at this point it it's like the overall volume of this track is just taking it down or not, but you're yeah. you're you're immersed in it for some it's reason. It's very thin texturally, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially towards the end when uh, Snoop Dogg steps yeah. in. Nickel plated nine, bang bang, blow your mind, beep beep, flat line. Gotta get yours. I been had mine. Hold my hand, laying in the bed. Family crying, they think he dead. No jokes, no hoax. Felt his palms, he had no pulse. All right, first off, very dark, and the fact that it's accompanied by. Even the the strip, most stripped down of the music itself, so you're getting Snoop Dogg right in your face, right in your ears. He's just cooing to you, like Snoop does. <laughs> cooing, gotta love it. Interesting. That no clutter around it, really, really in your face, really, just right up there. Here's the message. Let's let's really hammer it home. I will I will make that correction, of course, because the earlier on it wasn't uh, Snoop Dogg, it was it was Captain Murphy singing, yes. but he still has a pretty chill voice himself, and it's kind of nice to hear him as as a singer. I assume, you know, that's just him. It seems pretty un un uh, edited, or was it? Was it? Was there a lot of post uh, no, it filters like on this? It, it, it would probably it didn't sound electronic or overly vocalized. It sounded like a sounded, voice. It sounded like a voice down to earth. Um, in that case, I gotta mention something else here because this was one specific moment in this track that I really, really liked a lot, and it happened in the same instance that I, I referred to earlier with that like seesawing thirds down to E minor, which usually would just enter in, hold up, hold up, why do you make us think you're dead? Now all of a sudden, it, this occurs in the second verse, um, which it was at a uh, minute thirty six seconds, second stanza of that verse when it reaches E minor for that second time, instead of that like hypnotic, hypnotic abyss of that chord, instead the keyboard takes over here. And this keyboard was so much warmer, so much more prominent. It's still on E, but it arpeggiates, still more expansive, because it invokes a few of those suspensions. It just takes every, it takes the music out of itself for a minute, and I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Again, looking for moments inside moments. These tracks are pretty short as a whole, but I'm still finding like little snippets of things within an otherwise, an otherwise great uh, concept, a great, a great snippet. It's a snippet and a snippet. I mean, I'll say that this album seems very approachable comparatively now that we're almost, uh, well, we're actually only about a quarter of the way through, but it yeah. feels more approachable than the last record, at least to me. I don't know if that's a sweeping statement, but for me, for sure, I feel like it's more approachable. Yeah, uh, I can see that given, I mean, especially these two songs, it's they're kind of weird in some sense because I feel like, I mean, it sounds like the album, but what comes before and what comes after... I don't know. It's just like he's like, ah, I'll put the songs with the rappers right next to each other. Why not? Yeah. But, um... I well, there's a connectability between these songs. Between 4, 5, 6, they seem to have a little bit more, I don't know, through Pep. line, through think, everything, yeah, as far as that. connectability. Well, I would actually say 1, 2, 3 sort of have the same sort of idea. This is something that we kind of had back in, I don't know what episode, Boards of Canada. Oh, oh, episode, episode 54. Well, we started linking duos, trios, and quartets of songs together thematically um, as sort of like one grouping of ideas, but then the next grouping of ideas started creating a through line for each group. Well, that's another thing that's wonderful about music in the bra is that you can find whatever bracket or bracket within the bracket that you choose to find. Yeah. So for me, like it could be a couple of measures at the same time. I also really love those those three-track behemoths, which you just feel were, were, were expertly. They take you off on, on an emotional journey over the course of those three tracks that you have never experienced before, couldn't be replicated. Um, and we, you, we tend to see these as like, uh, as like the culminating points of albums, but it's also used to break it up from a, from a genre perspective. Like we got the jazz fusion thing earlier on, it seemed to be in that cluster. Then we were like in like R&B soul territory, it seemed to be in a cluster there. I don't know how to describe turkey dog coma, but I know this. <laughs> nice segue. Yeah. I know this. 
It was a little bit more of a dancey tune. It definitely seemed like it was, At I parts. guess, a little... Maybe we're on the same train here. We're still in the dance for a little bit. It felt like a two-step, but it was a lot louder again, a little bit more imminent. Very heavy rhythm. This yeah. is what I was actually expecting Flying Lotus to do. Yeah. This song. Just from knowing the previous album. Because this song has... Not even sections, just phases of what he's doing. Yeah. It goes into... The, a, a speed box. I don't know how any other way to try it. Just a going on in the background. Uh, that kind of throws a wrench in it to me. Guitar steps in. It slows it down a little bit. The piano does a lot of work to slow that down too. But now we got a weird echoing effect that's kind of distracting me. That happens. Then we minus a lot of that junk and get into a really nice setup of like a picking guitar duel going on. Then we get into, I, the only way I could describe it was Sweet Memories, a nice expansive piece. Following that, we get a jazz little splash back in here, and then a nice ending of almost choir work. It was what I kind of expected of just, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. It was a lot that was offered here, more than, I guess, than previous tracks. Um, I also felt... I felt kind of satisfied by this track. Uh, again, he does he does his typical thing in the beginning, where he kind of he ha he offers something completely new that that shocked me, and then he follows it by that like brief little ditty, which seems like it's an idea that could be expanded, but he doesn't. He never he never follows through on that, and then he gives what seemed like it was a courtesy breakdown at first. It starts with like that whirring in the background, like like near like that tremolo that you might do on a, on, a, on a violin very, very close to the bridge, so it sounds very rough around the edges. Um, and I gradually started to realize, after he introduces one instrument after the other, the the crisper, more like pizzicato sounds also used by the violin, um, it, it was, I don't think it was a courtesy. I, I felt it as a courtesy in the first in the first like few seconds, it was like, okay, he's done this before. He but did this in the first three tracks. More he, natural. It was something I described earlier on as like the wind down, where he's like, okay, let's just chill and culminate for the rest of the track. This was, this was probably more truer jazz noir than I think we'd gotten earlier in the record. This was even at times when you're getting, but it was experimental, like art rock jazz. That's noir. the whole thing. You're getting replacements for what you would typically get for a jazz noir idea you're getting more electronica replacing some of the some of the like the staples quote unquote the the, the standard horns or the standard uh, upright or the standard guitar or what have you i think you're I, getting a much uh, an, an, an updated idea to this jazz noir it's not it. just an updated idea it's like he's taken this this album to a whole new plane of mellow and at certain points here the space the, just that that breath is is almost stifling. Like, but there's a lot of stuff. To, it, not a lot, but a complicated stuff you got to get through before you get to that mellow in this song, and that's what bothers me. That's what bothered it, you. That's yeah. what I loved about this track. Actually, that's what I felt was most most tasteful. And even if I do believe there's like structure in here, but it's the kind of thing that is so natural and free flowing that you can barely even you can barely even take it in all at once. It's all just like this this strand of one thing after the other, which I understand could maybe jar a few people, but it's 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 not in the same vein as like freeform avant-garde. Instead, it's just crooning along. It it seems it seems delicate. And there's something about that that doesn't doesn't hit me as as avant-garde. And that's what I liked about it. Well, I think I wouldn't say that this was an avant-garde track. That comes later. I think that this track No, yeah, I'm I'm not even really I would never said that about this track. It was okay. more just like the 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 concept of the flow throughout, as to where someone might perceive it as derailing or introducing one new thing after the other. I guess that concept is on guard, but that's not this. I, it felt a little schizophrenic because it did jump around quite a bit, mm. but I don't think that was a detri to a detriment to the song. I mean, also based on what I've heard him do before, he's at least. If he's all over the place, he's putting it in a more concise space or time frame. So it's not being all over the place throughout the entire record like the last record was, mm -hmm. which made it hard for me to follow. Here he's jumping around within this track, but it still feels very connected to the rest of the record. And I will say the track itself does seem to have a connection that I was really lacking and where I was pointing out problems in the earlier tracks, where I didn't see as much of a connection uh, or as much of a through line. Here... While I can't say the beginning really is that mellow 
that you're going on with, Steve. Hmm? Th- by the end, I definitely feel it. It's definitely there. No, I never. Really... Yeah, no, I never said the beginning was mellow. Remember, oh, it started okay. out as a dance. It was like a two step, and then again, it's one of those things two where step. I would almost my feet would fall off trying to follow that two step. Man. Well, I would omit that section of the song, <laughs> but I think the progression of it was just a lot more natural. Remember, I omit down. I omit the ditties. I think a lot of times his ditties are almost throwaways. Uh, I'm really more about his 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 room for expansion whenever he does that and i i tend to enjoy it more whenever it's on the mellower side and this this track i think really pursued that in the later in the later parts later measures oh i don't really think he's a a throwaway guy you know i feel like everything he does is very very thought out and very deliberate you know and just how you said before like he was a I don't know what the phrasing you used was, like, he's giving us a break or something like that. Yeah. Like, I don't even feel like he would do that, like, uh, let me give him a, you know... <laughs> let me throw him a bone. Yeah, let me throw and him that's a bone. Because not... if, you, if you listen to him talk, he's, like, very, like, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. You I know, like... I don't feel like this stuff is accidental. That's, that's... Yeah. I, I there's wouldn't... a method, but there's a... It's, it's a method of madness. Oh, that's sure. That's definitely there, and... The twists and turns that he goes through, I mean, when you when you talk about track seven, Turkey Dog Coma, yeah, it's there. And in hindsight and upon a few repetitions, I heard it. Yeah. But first glance, first listen, this one's throwing a lot at you very quickly. Yeah. And that's not, you're, you're not going to hear it on a first. And that's going to be a problem. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll correct them. I mean, throwaway is the wrong word to use. It was really just more my interpretation, my impressions of this album. I find myself more impressed by some things than I do others. Yeah. And I guess that's the distinction I want to make, because a lot of times he throws in these little prog ditties, and they seem just so, so transitory. I, I can't, I, I, there's not enough there. There's not enough yeah. content for me to oh, get some into. some notes. What's that? Like, oh, Yeah, oh, some notes. some notes, exactly. And then, and then all of a sudden he goes into this, like, introverted plane to another dimension and he's just yeah. there and he's in, lost in his own world but that's that that's that's what i want to hear because that well that's art then suddenly it seems like he's a little bit more into himself where the others are just like well here's the thing yeah so maybe you know it's not it's not like i want to treat that as throwaways but i guess it comes off to me as a listener as a throwaway when you're listening to this album some stuff just seems so much more pertinent yeah um all right i think that's a good time to go on to track eight stirring which is i think the signify I would call it the signifying interlude of this album. It's really brief as as even these tracks go. It's thirty seconds long. Mm-hmm. But what I really liked about it is it almost feels like and and Tony was, is pretty much convinced that it was, played in reverse. It was something that was recorded forward and then mixed and replayed in reverse. It has these kind of warps and jumps that feel like listening to something playing backwards. Yeah, there's a or these individual intake. sections that were played. Yeah, like backwards. Backwards. Portions, yeah. yeah. A slight intake to it, but for, it's a cool thing, effect. Like I mean, the guitar, really like the it. guitar I don't think was played in reverse. The guitar was pretty straightforward. It sounded almost a little bit Spanish at some point. It had this like quick dramatic strumming, like you know, like a Spanish play or something. I don't know. It it, it was hard to really. This was one of those cases which I guess I I really even couldn't defend it on the on the on its brevity. I I just I didn't think that was enough here. But it it was an interlude, so I kind of gave it the pass. But, but I'm not like about to look for thematic material. Well, yeah, but track nine has a similar effect, so I feel like it was just like our uh like fucking dead. It was just designed to be an intro to the next track. Mm, well, track. Track 9 had a little offered a little bit more, also because it had vocals, but that's kind of important. So let's just move quickly on to Coronus the Terminator. Um, right off the bat, I want to say that this track, I loved it for the fact that it incorporated more external sound effects. This time he actually like, brings in setting. The very beginning it is, is like rain pitter-patter off a gutter. It, it sounds very... Very much like it's in an alley or something. It's, yeah. it's it had a noir feel from the moment it started. It, but, well, but I less want to use the word noir here. We're always using it, but this time, this time it's like natural. I want to say that's the first thing for me. It had a very it has the setting outside. as opposed it's to how outside. we decide. It's no longer a studio produced piece, which a lot of this feels like it's just coming from a guy making music. This one feels more expansive. The setting, like you said, is actually developing here. Okay. I No, yeah. Noir, here's the thing. Noir is a genre. Noir is an actual genre, and a lot of times when you say noir, well, you're referring to that genre. So it's inappropriate to say that here, because this time, using it more in its legitimate sense, and that was correct. John said, natural. It feels like the setting itself. It's nighttime. It's rainy. It's a little bit 
a little bit depressing, and he's actually fulfilling this in the sound effects themselves. It's not just impressions of that, it's that, legitimately. And it has those elements of R&B uh, that I thoroughly love, which is the, the sensual side and that, that depth, that, that kind of reverberation that R&B likes to use. Uh, the low end, the more of a heartbeat drum work being filtered in here. And on the flip side, a more almost choir-oriented vocal work done here. This, this combination gives it, just for me, even though it's a little, it's still in that darker place, it's definitely the lighter side. It, it gives me a more wholesome feeling here than I've gotten anywhere on the album. This one, it, it's got a dash of hope in there. It's rejoicing, almost. It's rejoicing, and I guess maybe in the sense that that we associate gospel as rejoicing. Yeah. I still don't think that that backdrop, and we had an interesting discussion on this where, where we were like, no, is, it, is does it offer some hope? No, 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 no it's just pure well, depression. You two say this one, and I say that one, and he says the third thing. I guess it comes down to, oh, then you got to look at the lyrics. Then you got to look at the lyrics, because obviously the vocals the themselves. <laughs> well, all right, because I'd like to save you. Make me talk to you, because I'd like to save you. The days of bitter are coming to an end, so come with me if you want to leave. You can find time where they're not for sale. I need this. I need the same, too. There's nowhere left to go, so I'd like to save you. All right, fine, it is hope. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think music- um, but it's just not there in the musical no, backdrop at mus- all. Musically, so, you know. it had a darker feel, but yeah, lyrically, it does have a more uplifting tone, which I think gospel kind of really lent to it. Which is where I get to my metaphor that everybody was like, nay, nay, nay. I'm it's still going to be nay, nay, nay. It's the after funeral. It's after the death. It's after the acceptance. It's that moving on part. The days of bitter are coming to an end. Right there. That grief is now starting to lessen. It's not the full darkness we've gotten in the previous track. It doesn't even hold a candle to something like Dead Man's Tetris. This is... Just different ways of pursuing it, though. I mean, I can't compare that only because this time we actually... But this isn't pre or during. This is fully post. This is post-death. All right, I'll admit, no, we we did actually come to that word when we were talking about it. It does feel like it has more of, like, a contemplative or, like, ruminating quality. Um, I'll give it that. I'll take it. That. I will if take you see, it. If you, see, if you see joy in that, well, Not that's joy. up to you. Not But joy. all right, no, hope. But acceptance. Hope. Hope. I guess, might even I be guess better. whenever anybody's ruminating, there's some hope in there. Yeah. So you're trying to make sense of things, you're trying to get along with life. I think kind of every, maybe not every song, well, maybe the ones where you could tell, are supposed to be after the fact. Okay. Or like on the cusp of being after the fact. Like some, you know, I kind of think of someone who's in sort of, uh, you know, the in between land, like limbo, and they have to sit there and be like, how do I feel about this? You know? That, that's that's an interesting point you raise, and I guess you can even find that when you look at the titles here. I mean, there yeah. are such... Even like turkey dog coma. Okay, fine. <laughs> Omit the turkey dog. Look at the coma. Yeah, it's the like coma. The itis. Yeah, and I, again, how much I was raving about that track, it does kind of feel like, well, not that I've experienced a coma personally. I don't think most people really experience comas. It, it goes... It, well, yeah, they do, but they don't remember it necessarily. It's a proverbial coma. There proverbial coma. But it's okay. sort of like high frantic energy, cusp, and then the slow decline. I... It, symbolism? I don't know. Yeah, because you're, you know, you're super excited. You're eating those turkey dogs left and right. It's, it could be anything. It could be pizza yeah, or bagels. That's it. And and then, go, yeah, and you're, you're feeling great. And then next thing you know, you're on the couch. And the you're food, not feeling so hot now. The quintessential food coma. Yeah. Now all of a sudden it's just like, don't touch me, don't talk to me, I, I'm not going to work. <laughs> Put on football for teams I don't care about and yeah. fall asleep. Um. <laughs> all right, so we've, I think, t- talked up Corden as the Terminator. I, I, you know, there's only one thing I have to mention, and that's the fact that this is another uh, similarity to Black Messiah. I felt it really yeah. here in the vocals, especially with that like overlapping, well, we kind it. of loose vocal work. When we find anything that's kind of an electronic influenced R&B, I mean, it's going to bring us back to that album since we reviewed it so recently. At least, yeah, at least for the foreseeable future. Um, Next track, track 10, is uh, Siren Song featuring Angel Deradurian? Deradurian. 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 Um, This this one, what I liked about it is that the start of it was this kind of slow trickle. It, it, It was a slow burn that built, and then it just... It explodes outward from the song with this kind of wonderful, almost angelic sound. This kind of... I don't know. I don't really know how That's to describe it. I can describe it. I, I can describe it. 
because first off, the the song has feels like it's much much more methodically spaced in its repetition uh, because it's it's less cluttered here. It, it seems to be a little bit pure instrumentally, less layers being filtered in there. That's it's, a, that's it's a... sweeter. It's more open. It's it's so different in feel from the earlier part of the album that it's a whole different slant emotionally for me. I think this song and the last two both are rather all have that quality a little bit because I think they all have chimes in them or something like a chime. Yes, I wrote that. Yeah, uh, like yeah. A, they, and they all have that. And I think that's kind of maybe it's just how we associate it with it. But it's you know kind of like whimsical and nice and breezy. But breezy, the, I think it's, is a it's good not word. heavy. You know, chimes like oh, chimes have. Well, pleasant. no, there is a heavy element to it, and that is, is the though. breathing, the woman. Well, we're, actually, I want to just hold off on that, because okay. that comes later, and I would call that the culminating point of this track, for sure, especially considering the word you used, spoiler, orgasm. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> when we're looking at this, I, I think the whole last half of this album, I think it follows a lot of what both of you said. I think, I think it seems like he just kind of let loose a little bit. He's using most of his lighter material. He reduced a lot of tracks. Everything is a lot more... Is a lot thinner, and again, this followed through on another uh, similarity as the previous track. It, it's it's using those those external effects, something to kind of ground you in something. And here, I, I found it was vinyl scratches. The entire track feels like it's it's played off of an old vinyl. Uh, that's just, yeah. He actually does that quite a lot, where he adds you know tape hiss, mm-hmm. vinyl, whatever. I mean, you can probably hear that almost on all the tracks to some extent if you really listen. They all have like a warm quality, you know? Yeah, I could I could definitely see that just as a whole, but this one, it felt like it was really amped up a notch. Yeah. Um, and maybe also because of the fact that the other instruments have dropped out quite a bit, then, you know, it's a little bit more highlighted. And some of them are probably sampled as well. True. And, uh, yeah, but it's like scratches are static. Beyond that, you're looking at a few things, just like a light bass work, light keyboard work, and it is very slow. I mean, what this finally amounts to is this... This rhythm that it's probably like down sixty beats per second or something like that, unless you just see that as the as the beat one of your whole entire measure, in which case it's quicker, but you don't feel it. The emphasis is really on just that that single beat spaced over perhaps sixty beats per second, very very slow, and it's I found it to be kind of an interesting, maybe a culminating point of the album, only because he'd yet to really get this wound down. And then over that, we get those female vocals. And that's what felt very, very bizarre. Um, Because you hear it even, like, separated by by stereo. It's, like, coming out of the left ear, then out of the right ear. So you have this sense of of space and being surrounded by it. It's, it's, it's just a, it it builds up to the climax. I mean, frankly, a lot of these words are just euphemisms for sex itself. And when we're describing music, and... The combination of what's going on here is why it just feels like a true, just elongated orgasm. It it it's not crude. It's not that, but it does have the same sort of feel. And this is a a uh, French idiom, I think is the term, le petit uh, mort, the little death. Okay. Thematically, especially after that climax into the combination of. Almost background breaths that her voice is doing, just the the, the distant going in the background, uh, the culmination and drop off. It's just thematically, it works so well with all the other things we've already been saying. Uh, I, that might even be a more appropriate title for this track. Yeah, and also I don't. I mean, sirens make people come to them. I was just singing. about to say the same. I mean, but that's, that's I don't know whole... if it's is that supposed to be a sexually charged thing or is it just well, supposed to be... It can be. not really. But I well, it, I guess it's 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 more like the anticipation of it. It's not really like the culminating point. Sirens are technically supposed to. If, if you're going back to like Homer's Odyssey, they're supposed to veer you off the path where it's just yeah. like you know you're, you're you're basically not thinking with your head, <laughs> um, thinking with something else, obviously. And so that makes sense that that would yeah. be a possible interpretation. And also the concept of the very slow nature that it feels very it feels almost haunting in a way, like it has evil intentions, perverse intentions, yeah. perhaps. And my favorite thing about this, again, this is linking theme with music on, on a real. In a real strict way here is the changing up of the breathing itself, which was really, really fascinating because the accent shifts. It goes from the accent being just on the single vocal note, which is pretty breathy in itself, and then all of a sudden 
all of a sudden the, the, the breath is on the accent of the breath itself prior to the note. So you get the, and then the note. But the mm. accent is on the breath, not the note. That's cool. And I found that to be really, really, it, it brought to life the whole breathing thing. Because it's like, all right, fine. People use breath a lot in a lot of lyrics. It makes it more human. It makes it more humanized. But here, this was just, that was a tech tactic, a technique that I've never heard before. It made it seem a lot more pivotal. Um, and we, we get here also with this song, uh, more connectivity, how we were grouping the songs together. This one also connects very well to the next track. Mm. They, they link up very well. Considering we're like coming off the cigarette after sex, essentially. <laughs> and, and track 11, Turtles, though not in title, at least, feels very connected. It, it still feels sensual, but it's a more tribal kind of post, post-sensual post feeling. Which... It, it loses uh, a, a, the, the erotic factor of the previous track that I saw, and it really becomes just sensual, yes, but more sensory. Uh, it, it like it, replaces it's... it with nature. Yeah. yeah, and it it's... feels very in 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 nature, and for, you know the groove that's in it. Still, and it's the wooden percussions that I think yeah. accomplish that best. It's those chimes that are brought back, and also the little tweeting birds in the background. And the, strangely enough, the whole thing is, sits on top of like a dial tone kind of sound. Yeah, it, it's it, that drone. This it's... is also another track where they revisit this idea of ruminating, like almost an afterthought after that culmination. Like now you've had that culmination, now you're thinking about what it really means. Mm -hmm. That little death, or whatever you want to refer to it as, like you're you're thinking about it now. You've had the the moment, the event, now you're reflecting on it. Le, not, le petite mort. Le Thanks. petite mort. <laughs> Which is probably pronounced wrong anyway. You, Actually, I, took French. I know how to pronounce French. French? French. I think you just ruined your credibility. I did, I did. Oh. Also, not a complex uh, chord structure. Again, speaking to how thin it is, it's pretty simple. It's just like G down to E, down to the relative minor, back up to G. So it's just this back and forth kind of, that, that really is like almost the entirety of the song I found. Um, but the bass work itself was pretty creative. I really loved the fast-paced runs in the background. There's that bass coming in again that I really, yes. really like. Yeah, that's like. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. This is the first song where Thundercat starts playing in, like, I don't know, maybe three, four, five. But I, I don't know if it's really intended to be like a, oh, just so you know, he's back. <laughs> but it could be that. Because, you know, a couple songs later it starts getting back into the, the jazzier vibe with mm -hmm. a lot more of the band instrumentation. Yeah. It, and I think it... it I think these songs grouped together work really well. Um, I also kind of like how it just, it again, it feels very R&B and very natural, but also the wooden percussion adds that kind of echo, which really just kind of makes it resonate a little more. And it adds a little bit more diversity. He's using a different kind of percussion here. Instead of the standard beat work or machine drum kind of stuff he's been doing, he's now using a wooden percussion, which echoes very differently. Wooden, yeah. Perhaps it's like a marimba or something. Like something that. like that, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Nothing thing about the, that bass, it's like the, I don't know, something about the quality of it here. This actually reminded me of the bassist in Pinback. Um, I don't know. I'll just throw that name out there. Sure. For anybody who knows Pinback, nope. maybe it'll spark it. I don't remember that album that well, so I okay. can't say that I can hear that, but, I mean, you could very well. Well, not that right. album, but earlier Pinback. <laughs> oh, so, I okay. see. Yes. Okay. Um, and this... Ignorance. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Track 12. Ready, er, not, rather, er, not, as in to err. Okay. It's important. This one has that Maybe. kind of, and Tony had pointed this out, this kind of cartoonish, creepy vibe. It feels very much like um, the the little odd, the more odder cartoons of the '90s, and that kind of weird, creepy or kind '80s of or '70s or, or '60s. But the point is, it's got this kind of it. The evil intent doesn't seem so abhorrent just by the music, but it definitely gives this idea of something horrible. It's a classic villain feel. The eyes are too wide. They're set a little bit too close together. The brows are severe. This is, to a T, like first generation, second generation Joker kind of a feel. This is a villain. Dun, 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 that you oh, really yeah, can't sure. take too seriously because you know he's going to get beat in the end because that's what superheroes do or the whatever it does. But, or Flying Lotus. It's yeah. it's not that clear, clear cut because while it is a kind of a simple creep supervillain beat, it's not you know it's not a hundred percent just that though. I feel like now we're actually opposite 
<laughs> just because you were finding such joy in things that I found so dark early in the album, and this was just cheerful. I never even thought of a supervillain in this. I just, I was loving this. From it's not a supervillain you can take seriously. All right, this is this is Captain Planet supervillain. This is right. Felix the Cat. This I think is su- not. I think supervillain is way too extreme. It just has a cartoonish creepy. Okay, feel. it has a, a cartoon. But in that demons. case, in that case, I just take a different route with this, and that's to describe the music as as kind of eight bit. But I need to go earlier than that. It feels like. Like if you're talking about generations of, of 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 gaming here, this is like Pong. It utilizes the Pong sound, uh-huh. as in like individually, and it takes that and then enhances it. And well, Flying Lotus does his thing. Enter him. Yeah, I don't know if there's panning or something, but it actually does physically feel to me like it's somewhere or rather pinging and ponging. Mm-hmm. I mean, but other than the actual, you know, feeling it gives me of that whatever sort of cartoonish, creepy whatever thing. Um, it's also just the sounds themselves I like. They just a little tink tonky like I don't know, they sound like high attack, very brief. It's Yeah, yeah. I like it it's it's fun. I just like those sounds. It's it, it's it's you know what it is? This is the closest thing that we've had in similarity on this album as uh Putty Boy Strut was yeah. to the previous album. It uh, is reminiscent. Comes. I had said that this track f- felt very reminiscent of the previous record and there's some other tracks later that also kind of remind me of that oddball kind of feeling that you got yeah. a lot on the last record. And in 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 mind Matt's and Nelson's less uh less thorough review of that album, I remember we all cited that that track individually as being like like you know the, the one star the one star it, well but of the course it's the point. single I mean, I mean he knows again he knows what he's doing he well, releases this is the single also for the most part he's a much more artistic guy he doesn't really stri- stick in like these these confined territory his pure goal is not just to be like here dance to this go have fun he's looking for larger things and i appreciate that as a musician but it does seem like when he does release that track it's good and it's really good and all the music videos that are released to him are incredible i love the one the putty boy strut uh now on a slight little tangent i almost picked this album a while back and the reason i didn't pick it is because i saw the video first (laughs) there's a reason for this um the song itself, if I'm not mistaken, the video itself actually has a disclaimer before you watch it. And if you're squeamish, which I did not realize I was squeamish, <laughs> don't watch the video. It is a warning. If anybody, and I've talked about them multiple times, remember Salad Fingers. Same artist did this video. The combination of the video and the music is actually really disturbing. If you like weird stuff that's meant to disturb you, please go see this video. Because, frankly, it's very artistic. I will point that one out. It's very artistic and very well done. It's just not anywhere near the alley I want to be walking down at night. It's it's so weird and bleh. Well, I like the fact that at least you can think outside the box, even in a, in a track that I'd otherwise... Can, we all viewed so fairly positively, um, you know... You bring in a visual, a visual association, then all of a sudden it's just like, okay, that's that's, that's not what I expected. And yet, the funny p- thing is that the video for Putty Boy Strut also had its 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 um, high minded concept behind it. That was more of like a uh, an allegory for for consumption, maybe even yeah. capitalism. I think I toyed around this idea. Wow, throwing in the idea of mechanical evolution into the mix right there. Robot makes more robots until all of a sudden it's just this big giant sea of robots, which then in the end turns to a butterfly. Think about it. The, the true adaptation of uh, robotics and naturalism and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that is. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's a good track. Uh, track 13, <laughs> Eyes Above. So this one also was another one that kind of made me think back towards the previous record. It had a very industrial, electronic feel. It had those pings and pongs, as Tony is mentioning, that are very reminiscent of what I know of Flying Lotus, at least. It brought me back to the better parts of that last record that I liked, and it kind of engaged me quite a bit. But for this album, I felt like this was a devolution. It was taking a little bit of a step backwards, um, because... It, while, while it doesn't have the clutter that was a little bit of a complication in previous songs, it, I felt it was a little bit too sparsely populated here. It's The layers themselves just felt naked. They, they felt a little bit too exposed. Two points to that. Half agree, half don't. Only because of the fact that, well, it's been sparsely populated again since the middle of this album, the center point. Um, I've liked that. I like the fact that the album took that turn. But I'm going to agree here. 
it's not really because it's sparsely populated that I don't like it. It's because it's 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 been there, done that. I think he's yeah. doing more here than he did early in the album. Now, granted, it's hard to like consistently be fresh on an 18-track album, but he's done pretty good so far. 19-track album. 19-track album, excuse me. Um, really, the one thing this offered was a little bit of James Brown samples. That was interesting. Yeah. And then, I don't know, on top of that, we're dealing with more of this. I'm, I find myself using the same words here. Well, the drums are steady, but interesting. There's a breakdown at the end. Oh, it gets silent. It gets delicate. It's the noirish guitar outro. Same stuff. I didn't find anything specifically fresh in this track. That may very well have been fresh had it been like the first or second track. Not at this point. I... I generally agree with that. I mean, okay. I actually can't think of it exactly in my head at this exact moment, but uh, in reference to the James Brown samples, the thing is that he, I think he literally does it twice, just like one yeah and one hey, nice. and it's kind of like, why, why'd you do that? And yeah. since he comes from such a, a hip-hop background, I wonder if it's sort of an intentional nod, since those are pretty prevalent in hip-hop back in the day, like... You know, it seems just very, you know, I find that's I'm doing a lot of it what, to do it for some reason. That's what sampling is a lot of times, like odes to yeah. the person that said samples taken from. Lots of people use Malcolm X samples, like, all the time. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, even if it is just an ode, I don't think it really contributed to the music. And I yeah. think we're... I think but he, has a, he has a sense of humor, so maybe he, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes. Like, maybe he's just doing it because he thinks it's goofy. Mm-hmm. Which could be. I mean, there are cases on this record and the previous record that I could... Isolate those moments. Go. All right. It could be him trying to have a sense of humor. When you have an, a record as vast as this, at least in scope, it's sometimes hard to tell when he's joking. There's so. a track coming up soon that I think is we're, is it all going to be about the sense of humor. Interesting but, discussion on that. But before that, we get track fourteen, moment of hesitation. So this one, we go kind of back to that jazz sound that was earlier in the record. Um, it, my my problem with this track, I think, is is where Steve was mentioning earlier that he's dipping back to moments that would be fresh if they were earlier in the record, but here it's kind of stuff we had heard already. And also, this one is where I feel like he's getting a little more avant-garde, and I don't know if I'm following as much, at least on this track. Hmm. It's a, it's kind of scattered brains. I I don't see really the, cohes- the cohesion, even in the, the earlier stuff that I said had very little cohesion here it's just kind of all over the place it, it feels like he's just doing texture pieces maybe in a sense and i don't i mean i like this but it is the kind of thing where i like it on its own merit and i, I kind of agree that this one and the last one almost seem like they didn't need to be on the album like mm-hmm. it would be nice if he just sent them to me in like a dot rar but <laughs> i don't they you know, they break it up a little bit, and because we were able to very clearly kind of put these in chunks, and I feel like these two, you know, at this point in the album, it's starting to get a little more, like, that's what's the arc here? Yeah, yeah what's the arc and where's the focus? Like, yeah. which where should I be on this album? What What is the style that you were yeah. pursuing? I, and I feel but then, like... I mean, that's also a fine line we tend to walk, because a lot of times we come across tracks and we say, oh, well, that, that let's... Where are, where are we supposed to be? But had it been that one thing, then we'd say, oh, well, this was a very repetitive album. All things considered, for a very uh, populated album of 19 tracks, he tends to keep it pretty unique as he goes. There's bound to be some falling out here yeah, toward the end. Yeah, can't blame him. Exactly. But, but you do have a couple things here that I think I found unique, and that's, of course, that, that muffled saxophone, which uh, sounds very, very breathy. That effect that's used on a lot of saxophones where you get the air right along with the noise itself. Mm-hmm. That was just, a, just an instrument that he hasn't really <clears throat> used earlier. We did get cases of saxophone earlier but i mean if you're gonna go noir who that is the sound effect to use i just didn't find the content to be particularly interesting that was unfortunate yeah i think on a whole to describe the song it just it's going to be a lot of repetitive terms that we have mentioned before and it's not like it's repetitive in the sense that it's detrimental to the record i just don't like i i kind of really agree with what tony said they're not bad songs they just feel like they don't need to be here because we've got most of it already frankly i just think this track was very Similar to track two in many, in many, many ways. In the way it utilized the snare and and somewhat extent the saxophones. I think there were saxophones there. I think an important uh, piece of knowledge to keep in mind is that, and I should have probably said this a lot earlier, but he was planning on making this like a quote-unquote jazz fusion album, and he's like, oh, I'm going to do all this, quote, music nerd shit with crazy time signatures and all this and that and playing super fast. 
And then I guess he decide he's like, oh, that's not really who I am, although clearly is partially. So I feel like there's sort of these remnants of that. Like where, an album he was working on and yeah, then didn't and then come he, to be, he so he just put it, it into this. Yeah. And I feel like maybe, you know, the first four tracks have that feel, and then he's like, oh, I have this other one I had. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> from, from track 14, we go to track 15, numerically, um, and go to Descent into Madness. Which I will is, say also the outro of that track, uh, into this track, it, it does... It follows upon another trend, trend of his, and that is that whole like release at the oh, very yeah, end the of the wind track. Down. Um, but it was another one of those cases where I would compare it almost directly this time, even more so to that Mari Tranquillitatis on Vangelis's Al- Albedo 0.39. It's a wordy, wordy sentence. Um, but track 15, Descent into Madness, is the first song that says specifically features um, Thundercat, who had been playing bass on other tracks in the record, but now I think he does a little vocals here. Is that correct? That is, in fact, correct. And so, the, the odd thing about this song is overall, it just, like, there were a lot of odd moments on this record, but this is one of the odder ones, because the, the bass kind of had a 90s feel, the vocals kind of reminded me of, like, early to mid sticks music with the vocalization and the weird narrative like think Mr. Roboto how the center of that song and the tail end gets so bizarre and the vocals to this really reminded me of that this kind of bizarre narrative that's not a narrative that we're not sure where it's going bringing up the bass and how it has kind of a 90s feel as you said this I, I think is really aided by the fact that it sounds very closely mic'd. Again, I bring up this up a lot. It's, it, a lot of people utilize it because eh, a lot of people like to go back to the '90s. It, it, it seemed to have that like raw, uncut, straight from the straight from the garage sound where you smack the microphone right in front of the uh, the amplifier, and it, it it gives a it gives a punch. It adds a punch to the the bass itself that it might otherwise not have. But it, you sacrifice cleanliness, but that's okay, you know. Um, like it's like dipping in the direction of Jocko without that that perfection of Jocko without that like clean no f- no flaws sound. Instead, this this actually pursues the flaws, right? It's going for something it just doesn't quite reach it, but that's where it wants to be. But it all for me it just comes off as just a deep scary theme. <laughs> that it's it doesn't really come off as fully. I don't know how to pra- place it. It's an off off Broadway show opening theme. Not you, you know, feel it's very avant garde and very odd. And... Not no, not avant garde because I kind of expect this from a one man off no, off Broadway show. I agree with this, but again, just to throw out different ideas and how we might have different impressions for perhaps the same thing. Um, I, I thought back to like the whole art song concept where you take. A stanza from a existing poem and then you write this elaborate song around it and it's not really meant to be um it's not meant to be like a straightforward reading of the poem it's more like an artistic musical interpretation of the mood of the poem that's kind of what art songs are and that that seems to be how this this uh this evolved another way of putting it is it's kind of like a german expressionism film like like oh, i don't yeah. know it's like it's about to break it's out rockets. at some point sure and also, like with the tonal clusters, it does little, those dense moments. I think that's another reason why it, we associate to the highfalutin, artsy fartsy, um, oddball tapping into your surrealist subconscious. That's what it's trying to do. Uh, I find with this one and Ready or Not and Dead Men's Tetris, which all have a creepy, somewhat scary, you know, vibe, depending on how you feel about it. Like you guys love Dead Men's. Tetris was kind of menacing, but I, I don't know, maybe it's just because Snoop Dogg's there, maybe it's the beat, but I kind of was like, oh, look, it's kind of like, derp, derp. That's like, what I got, no, I t- But I this one sounds a little like that, only because it's so overwhelming, but admittedly, when I listened to the album the first time, I was like, whoa, this is like really telling me some serious stuff right now, it's kind of scary. With the, even with, if you go in the German expressionism route, it's like, <gasps> there's a murder afoot. You know, that kind of yeah. thing. So yeah, yeah, but I've seen a lot... Well, no, frankly, I haven't seen a lot of German Expressionism because I don't enjoy it much. It's not really my shtick. I like it. It's enjoyable. <laughs> I like the 20s, though. That's, that's another reason. I, but, I, you know, the 20s were more than freaking Charleston. There was a lot else going on in the 20s. It was They were pursuing, I think, certain art forms that maybe weren't entirely followed through. He was. Pop. He's showing his old man. A little bit right there. A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. A little bit. Um, but, I mean, we can all agree, I think, that this track still felt a little oddball 
considering. I mean, you know, as oddball as those other tracks that you mentioned, just yeah. something's a little off. Something's a little weird it's about it. It's disconcerting. And I mean, it doesn't really <laughs> stop there. We get we get further oddball and even more ridiculous in track 16, The Boys Who Died in Their Sleep, featuring again Captain Murphy, which is Flying Lotus, but it's his uh, rapping name. Um, this one is just, I mean, from the moment the lyrics start, you can't help but laugh if you're focusing on them. From the moment the vocals start, you can't help but laugh. I... If you look at the lyrics themselves, okay, it looks pretty legit. Someone has to pay for this. Someone's got to pay the bills. I can't even look in the mirror. Oh, baby, would you get my pills? I need a Zanny and a Vicodin, a Percocet and a Valium, anything to take the edge away. Okay, this seems pretty serious. This seems like this guy's in, in a bit of a in a bit of a, a bit of a sticky spot. Well, <laughs> the vocals are absurd. It's yeah. like this ironic expression of this very dark place. Instead, the vocals, he steps in with this ridiculous falsetto that's like crying at the break of every word. He's on the verge of just just cracking. And then suddenly that solo turns to duet when the second voice comes in, more of a straight lower, you know, baritone and just speaks very very steadily, kind of contrasting oddly against the the very animated uh uh falsetto so it's it's you can't help but laugh simply because of the two vocalists themselves and of course describing describing it doesn't do it justice it's about their comedic timing and the way they deliver these lyrics that just makes this a, a romp to listen to in my opinion uh there's rarely there's rarely any any edge there i think i i like if, if you're really listening to the lyrics okay fine you get that there's a sense of this but the vocals i, I think kind of cover it up they almost are mocking it I think. I didn't like the joke. Or I didn't quite get the joke. I mean, just straight up, after having Descent into Magnus, which seemed like, really, when you get down to it, kind of cheesy for me, this was just a continuation of that cheese going on here. It's kind of overblown avant-garde of an idea for me. It's, It's just so messed around with vocally that... It, it sounds like he's trying to be overly earnest. It's But it comes off as a cheap, just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a joke that, frankly, it had to be explained to me how they were trying to joke around with this. And when you have a piece of comedy that has to be explained, there's no comedy left in it. I thought it was self-apparent. I actually have been thinking about it, and before I kept on, I agreed that it was overtly a joke. And I can't say for sure that it is or is not anymore, but I was thinking, I mean, just given the lyrics, it almost, I get the image of someone in, who clearly has a pill problem mm-hmm. um, on drugs, just kind of like super spaced out, and that's like their warbly, like surreal, like I'm in a pill days voice, you know? And it has that sort of, I don't know, cartoonish vibe again to me, but it's still dark. Like, I feel like everything is almost tongue-in-cheek in that sense, where it's not quite supposed to be funny, but it kind of is. And I think it it, it leaves mostly to your own imp- interpretation of it. I mean, it's not unreasonable for John to have not gotten the joke. I think for me, because of where we were sitting in the album, these ridiculous vocals just made me laugh. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that it was a joke. I just found it funny. Because Steve's true. right, the straight reading of the lyrics are not funny. Like, the <laughs> lyrics themselves are actually quite depressing. But it's this, you know, about this idea of this guy with a pill problem. It's just how they were delivered that, to me, seemed comical. But again, it's Flying Lotus. He's He buries things within things, and he's doing a lot at once. And so I think that, technically, your volatile reaction to it, John, it might be just as intentional as our giggle about it. I think I think Tony is dead on. I think when you're looking at this at, at these lyrics, of course... Of course, it's the guy with the pill problem, and you're trapped in his head. And frankly, even if you're dealing with the seriousness of a pill problem, there's probably moments where you're just high, and everything's funny. Oh, sure. And that's it. And that's it. And, well, it's not until you actually release yourself from that that you can look back and be like, whoa, I was pretty lost there. So yeah. if you're in his head at the moment, then it makes perfect sense as to why you should find it funny. And his delivery just exemplifies that perfectly. Let's go to the next track, um, Obligatory Cadence 17. <laughs> So this was the obligatory science fiction opener movie thing. <laughs> that, it's sure. it's appropriately named. It's uh, it's there's what sounds like a theremin, whether it is or not, but it's giving this odd like '60s sci-fi kind of swoosh kind of sound. Mm-hmm. In the 60s to 80s, the science fiction yeah. didn't really evolve but, too much musically back then. But it's got that kind Excuse of sound. It, it, it's <laughs> take that back. I will. 
it's reminiscent of an older sound for sure, an older time. I, I, I don't know. I didn't get much from this track. I thought it was okay. I didn't dislike it, but it, you know, there I, were there were punk point marks with that sound, but beyond that theremin sound, it was still a lot of stuff that we're kind of used to hearing at this point. But it was nice in in one little aspect. It, if you're gonna say it harkens back to the '60s through whatever old school science fiction kind of a theme, and I, I'll say that it also romanticizes it. To some extent, that I did enjoy, it it's an updated version of that. It's not just old school. It it feels like it's almost nostalgic in a way. I enjoyed it simply on the grounds that well, all right, the theremin like thing was interesting, new texture, cool. Um, apart from that, the single uh, the single rip in the background of just breaking apart that that minor chord, that whole like one flat three five flat three one flat three, and then it shifts down to other chords, and it's it, I don't know. It seemed to provide a more of a like trance like state that had me lost and un unoffended as the track went. I didn't find it. I I, I don't know. I was very much like middle ground in this track. I I had pretty similar reaction. It's kind of like uh, eyes above and moment of hesitation, which it's kind of like what exactly is this doing at this point i mean it's obviously the album is winding down but nothing about this really screams out to me but at the same time maybe just the timing or the pacing of this track and how it sounds it doesn't really like you know i'm not like oh what is this doing here no yeah it was it was was a i think steve has it kind of pegged it was a non-offensive kind of oh it's an okay track here it is you know it was very face value i feel there wasn't much more to it than that and i mean that's not necessarily a bad thing and that's exactly how I felt about the next track, Your Potential slash The Beyond. The Ronda Beyond. Featuring Nikki Ronda. Yes. yes. This, uh, it wasn't overwhelming, it wasn't underwhelming, it was whelming. It was that very, it was kind of passive at this point. It was a subdued track. It wasn't as in your face as a lot of the other tracks. It's had been fairly in the past. Com- forgettable as well. I mean, uh, it was. I disagree. I disagree that oh, it's forgettable. No. Disagree. Just... No, let's, let's, let's call spade a spade here i think this track was first of all i think it was a callback i i believe there was a track on until the quiet comes although i can't verify this on air but i believe there's a track that featured Nikki ronda and i believe it sounded similar to this can't verify that off the off the bat but this was a very broad ethereal track granted maybe we're just so steeped in all the different little eccentricities of this album that it's hard to perceive something at this sort of penultimate as being as broad as it really was but this was a pretty a, a a pretty it's hard to describe this but i think again in speaking of culminating points this was one of those regions in which he was going for something much much bigger than the album itself her vocals stepping in there as just really almost as an instrument itself kind of crooning along with these very broad space rock like chord changes it's filled with longing it's filled with well, let's go to the words in the title itself. It's filled with potential. It's concerned with the beyond. I mean, maybe that's a cop-out just to quote the damn title. But honestly, these are the impressions that it gave me, even not looking at the title itself. I think this was... Th- this is the kind of thing that I think needs a visual... No, I won't say need. I will draw that. I think it could and would lend itself very well to a visual accompaniment. Perhaps that kind of like... That moment in in a very grand drama. Say, for instance, uh, The Fountain comes to mind. The Fountain had beautiful music by uh, Clive Mansell, I think, and a lot of it was along these lines, spanning a thousand years story, and a lot of it very tragic. This went the same route. In reference to what John said about it being whelming, (laughs) um, I think this album has... it's it's, It primes you in the beginning with such intense music you're like, okay, so what is the arc here? And then it, it really explores the bottom and the top. Like, there's these real extremes of calmness and craziness. And I feel at some point, I'm almost not even thinking, oh, is this a good arc? Is this a bad arc? He kind of has created within this album the ability for him to play with our expectations. True. Very true. I think uh, that's going to be very important uh, when we get to our wrap-up. But before we get there, our final track, track 19, The Protest. 
So, <laughs> this is the only time on the record I actually felt it kind of went a cliche route. I don't know that it's a bad thing, but, like, so this song starts, it's a beautiful piano intro, it's that guy in an empty room playing a piano. Many regular listeners would know this trope if we were We've mentioned it quite a few times, but, what I, but also what Tony brought up when we were listening is it also has that kind of cliche feel of, like, the exact imagery of an ascent to heaven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, the piano really does give that feel feel also because the piano has that kind of spiritual feel when you're just striking the keys it ended up kind of being a post battle if the battle is life wrap up kind of a song no <laughs> think about it yeah. think about it as a whole all this stuff is in a lot of ways alluded to during or post death like that that cuss but so much of this is actually conflict this is this is the rewards phase. It feels like a resolution. Yeah. It does. It feels like a conclusion to an album, to to an arc that may or may not have been there. But it does feel conclusion. Oh, no, it was there. It was there. But it, it it does feel final. It you know it's a it's a I think it's a good ending track, as cliche as it might be, and I think it fits everything that he was doing before it. And it's not that far fetched for what he would do. Mm-hmm. Well, in this case, the cliche comes off more as a classic. It's yeah. it, it's what this kind of needed. <laughs> sort of a unifying little piece of theory work here. Yeah, I think he kind of earns the right, so to speak, to use a cliche, because if he uses a cliche, it's almost not cliche, because it has means so much more coming hence, from him, because he's yeah, doing so many weird things. Yeah, classic. And let's also be honest about another thing. I mean, okay, we've, we've used the whole uh, piano in an empty auditorium rule before, but this is not just that. No. It's not like yeah. there's like there's a lot of other layers here. That's an element of a gr- of a grander song, but it doesn't hit like the same heights as the previous track. I think maybe this final track should have been a little bit more dramatic. I think it should have followed through on on the, the expectations that I had as of the penultimate and and it should have maybe, I don't know, gone gone just a little bit further. Uh I think there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Because, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, you know, it should be an album with a good arc and what have you. But there's so much kind of fun to that idea of him playing with our expectations and being like, you want that? Sorry, too bad. True. I'm making this album, not you. (laughs) Um, And the one other thing which I thought was interesting about this is that the second half, there's some drums start coming in. And it sounds like, like a classic Flying Lotus beat from back in ye olden days where they're much more sort of the you know the janky stuttery hip hop and i thought it was really <laughs> I interesting to fly notice in 2006 <laughs> yeah you know but uh and i thought that was kind of i don't know i don't know i felt like it was deliberate in some sense that after all this super exploratory stuff you know going all over the place they're just like oh, i'm going to end it with a good old classic flying lotus weirdo hip hop beat yeah, fair enough so as I mentioned like in the beginning, this was bound to be a very, very interesting review because of the fact that we were reviewing something that we addressed before, but perhaps not at our peak. There's d- multiple ways of reviewing albums, and there's multiple ways of pursuing what you like your album to be. And I think we've, we've defined pretty well what we like what we like in albums over the course of time, and we address multiple things, we've addressed theme, we've addressed arc. But this is not, like, this is not the end. I mean, also, theme can be stretched. Art can be stretched. And as that whole digression that we mentioned earlier, I mean, when you're speaking of, of, you know, art in the broad or an album in the broad needs to follow some kind of cohesive storyline from the beginning to the end, that's not always the case. A lot of times, I think it's just as big of a challenge when you're following things in in the micro-medium. And that's clearly what this guy does. And frankly, it's, it's who... It's, he's done it best. He's done it best amongst any examples that we've had of the previous. Granted, we haven't had that much examples. Most people have longer tracks. Most people are pursuing something over an album length. And then sometimes even those people completely throw away the the idea of of fulfilling your album, making sense front to back, and delivering you all the peaks and valleys that come with an arc, with an album arc. That's if they fail. I mean, in many ways, I'm impressed that he was able to keep this this tight. With so much material. With 19 songs, this is just very impressive that he's managed to keep it interesting as he goes. So that's something that I don't think we really addressed too closely when it came to 
uh, I don't want to go too deep into this because, of course, we don't really rate against existing discographies, but certainly what we marginally noted between me, Matt, and Nelson back in episode 19 and his album Until the Quiet Comes, we didn't go track by track. We didn't look at all these individual things because a lot of it was just bent around, well, yeah, let's just take it all in at once. But can you take all this in at once? My experience just writing notes on this album was very, very challenging because each segment was so transient that that you barely realized that you were barely able, able to get out a sentence before you realized it had passed and turned over into something else. Is that a fault or is that is that part of the art? Because after all, most listeners don't just sit back and take notes. They sit back and enjoy. I did that a couple times too, but when you need to talk about it, it's rough. That all, all that means is it's a challenge for us. What does that mean for the art itself? Absolutely nothing. That's what we have to rate on. So... It made me consider a couple of the other artists, and this is necessary to bring this into, into question um, when you're just going to justify your final number. I already mentioned Aphex Twin. That's important. I also need to bring up another one, which I think is under, under-referenced, and that's Machine Drum. Machine Drum we reviewed back in episode 77, brought to us by guest Hops, and it, too, was kind of in the electronica field, and it, it explored further further than, obviously, these short little minute spurts. But it pursued a lot of the same harsh transitions. It explored the element of surrealism, much like this did. Um, And as Tony referenced frequently, well, it plays around with your expectations. That's what he's doing. That's what what Machine Drum was doing. Um, I really like that album. I, I remember at the end having many, many songs I noted for its, uh, for for just the heights that it was reaching, even if the album arc wasn't as strong. But individually, it was really, really spectacular. Um, to, like, say that this album does not function because it doesn't fit your natural idea of an album arc is unfair. It would be like judging them squarely against other mediums. Say, like, a rap album by how not metal it is. That's stupid. I think... I think we just need to omit it entirely. I'm very impressed by this by this artwork, and I remember several moments over the course of this album in which he reached great heights, and several tracks which were cohesive entities of their own. I think, I think this easily reaches a four for me. I don't think it falls short of that, but I'm going to give it one little notch above that, a 4.1 for, for being the champ that he is and working over the span that he's working with. It's just... It's, it's an impressive feat. He's a detail-oriented guy, and he's made me both laugh, cry, and, and, and rejoice on this album all at once. Fantastic. I have so many issues with this album, but most of them are personal preferences. Be right up front with that. And that, I think, is why you should listen to what I said about the songs separately from how I'm going to review it. Because, frankly... When you want to talk art, and art is a word that gets that Steve's already thrown a lot, around a lot in his review, and I'm going to be doing the same. We'll, we'll metaphor this up. Uh, art galleries. A normal album broken up into an art gallery type of a setting is picture by picture by picture by picture. That's your song by song by song. Here are 19 tracks with over 50 or so ideas. We're, we're talking every little bit here could be just in another catalog. This is a collage. But it's a cohesive, progressive collage. It has point A, B, C, D. And while we are able to thematically, to some extent, uh, group these songs together in, well, here's one idea, here's another idea, that's mostly because we're seeing connections in the music. At the end of the day, this album, You're Dead, is so appropriately named. But it's not about death in the more in the classic form of death there's a lot of energy there's little snippets of hope there's a lot of attitude here it's a challenge against death as opposed to an acceptance or a mourning of death and that right there sets it apart thematically from a lot of other things that deal with the same topic i i really enjoy that i would add deadened states to that to that yeah collage. Death, death may may in fact be the wrong word. Dead in states or just post mortem, in in a lot of cases, might be a little more appropriate. It's 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 got integration of so many different ideas, yet still keeps them separate. 
it does have chunky parts. It does have issues with moving through those ideas. But that's why it's, it's a collage. It is a snippet of different pictures, different different thoughts he had in his head, put together in, well, at least in his mind, in Flying Lotus's mind, as a cohesive piece. I, I can't avo- fault him. I can't fault him for that. I avoided referencing the the issues because they're self apparent, and I think you're making them clear that there's repetition. There's um, in parts. There's there's difficulty in transitions in parts. Yeah, that's my big issue. Asking the audience to accept, essentially. Mm-hmm. And while well, like the joke, I didn't get the joke in the late part of the <laughs> album. And by the end of it, I'm starting to feel burned out, and that's really the biggest detractor of this album is that. It doesn't feel as sustained because, well, you're trying to pick out all the little pictures of this collage. Um, for that, I'm actually going to be more generous than Steve. Um, this is a 425. It is a solid endeavor. And musically, maybe not everybody's cup of tea. Definitely not everybody's cup of tea. But artistically, a, an in- incredible idea. It's not a foreign concept on Crash Chords to rate above or outside of your tastes. Um, For example, I personally rated The Paper Chase very highly when Wall Street Players brought them on, but I swore I would never, ever listen to that album again because it was so disturbing to me. That was back in episode 29. And I have held that true because I took it so emotionally to heart that I could not listen to it again. But I rated it pretty highly because it worked well. Flying Lotus's first record, I think my biggest problem with it was it wasn't a lot of it wasn't my tastes and the scatterbrainedness of it was just too much this album was a lot more approachable and I think it's also because I've grown as a fan of music which is important to acknowledge and I think also I think he's grown and I think he even though he still had unique moments that were sometimes scattered they were confined to songs the album as a whole didn't feel like a mishmash like the last one did it really felt like there were movements and pairings and moments, and I think that made the record more digestible for me. Would I go back and listen to it? Probably not. It's going to fit into that same place as Until the Quiet Comes of, I like a couple of tracks. I love Putty Boy Strut. I listen to it quite frequently. Um, there are songs here, like the Kendrick Lamarck song, I'm definitely going to listen to. Ready or Not, I'm probably going to listen to a bunch. There's definitely mo- full tracks here that I really like. But the album as a whole, I don't think I'll go back to. That said, it's an impossibility to deny his talent. Especially coming off of Aphex Twins, who I also thought was very talented, but I didn't really like that record much. And I faulted it for personal taste. Here, there was more personal taste that really engaged me. And the only song that really threw me for a loop was the song featuring Snoop and um, Flying Lotus's alter ego, Dead Man's Tetris. But again, I think it irked me because of the reasons John listed. To me, it felt very aggressive and odd and creepy. Creepy pasta. So I think that's what pushed me away from it. But as a whole, the dude's a talent, and he's really showcasing it here. Um, but he's definitely getting in his own head a little bit, too. It's very apparent. Um, but I won't hurt it for that. I'm rating it higher than I rated Aphex Twins because there's more I'll go back to here than I will on that record. And there was more of a cohesive sound to me here that was distinctly Flying Lotus even if the album itself felt a little scattered. So I'm going to be in the exact same range Steve is at. It gets a, a 4.1 for me. 4.1, and even speaking <sighs> of and speaking of songs I love, because I do think that's a very important thing, you do need to treat the song as, as an important element. Like, I love it front to back. I think that's just important to even rate a... Uh, you need to have a multitude of that for it to be in the fours. That's yeah. just kind of a prerequisite. And I can say I love The Boys Who Died in Their Sleep. I love um, Ready or Not. I love... Uh, the siren song. I love a little. I I love t- Turkey Dog Dog Coma, absolutely, and I love Dead Man's Tetris. So I eventually it's, love it's Turkey pretty, Dog Coma. It's pretty strong in that department. So there's two ways that this album sort of appeals to me. It's as an actual album, and to me, it's more of almost. I don't know if this sounds corny, but an experience because you really have to sit down and engage with it, or you're just gonna kind of let it go on in the background, like what's all this craziness. And in that sense, it's almost, I think it maybe shows certain limitations of the album format in that we have to divide them to tracks, because otherwise it's a pain to listen to some things like this, where they're almost, I mean, some are clearly tracks, but some things are just more timestamps. You know, it's almost one thing that needed to be chopped up into smaller parts. 
And I think it succeeded in that. And at times, you know, it wasn't perfect. There were certain songs I was like, maybe the song didn't need to be here. I mean, and that's funny considering the album is actually only 43 minutes long, but it feels a heck of a lot longer. And in reference to maybe his past work too, it kind of comes off of his third album, Cosmogramma. And I think it's like a logical evolution of that. And I appreciate that, him kind of revisiting this jazzy hip hop thing. Whereas Until the Quiet Comes, it's kind of like, uh, we're, what's this? What's going on here? Uh, I would have appreciated a little more, you know, pieces that were like songs that were a little more structured, a little less vignettes. But, you know, either way, I still loved it. But the other hand, or the, rather the other portion of this that I liked, is that it seems almost like a, a blueprint for a different genre that doesn't really exist. Where you might look at it and say, oh, it's jazz fusion, or it's whatever, it's hip-hop, it's this, it's all these things. But it almost seems like it's leading the way for, you know, because jazz is, you know, that's a whole other topic, but jazz has its own problems where no one really cares about it. And I feel like something like this is kind of hinting at uh, a flavor of jazz that maybe young, quote-unquote, hip people could actually be into, you know? Uh, the, it's gate, not, the gateway jazz? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. It's the gateway jazz. Or even just something, a potential future. Um, and I think that's important. So, overall, I guess I would give this a 4.3. It's hard to give numbers, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. It was flawed, though. I think it could have been way better, but it still you know, accomplish what it sought out to do to a large extent. All right. Solid. We're all in the fours. That's that. Um, and thank you for bringing us this album, honestly. Even though I was giving you hell about it at first, I mean, honestly, based on just preconceptions, it's important to, as always, remember when we're doing this that we shouldn't, unless you're Green Day, we shouldn't follow biases and just assume you're going to put out <laughs> crap. That's mean. After, episode 19 was like two years and three months ago. Yeah. So, so I'm it, still getting flashbacks to that one, though. <laughs> but I think it's important to there. really acknowledge <laughs> that some things can get better or change or you might view it differently. So thank you for bringing this record. Oh, my pleasure. Um, though, taking this record, and I mean, when Tony first joined us for the website it's the first time we'd really brought on a new writer who was just a writer someone that that all of us didn't know that we just kind of brought in from our local surroundings so I had a quote unquote phone interview with Tony to try and get to know him better I mean it was mostly just having a chat with somebody that I'd never met before so I could sort of know them better using this album as a Venn diagram for what you listen to is very frustrating because I have no idea because this album is a Venn diagram yeah, pretty much I try to keep it mysterious so what I'm my, my first question would really be Success. is what are your earliest kind of music influences and like what are the kind of things like favorite bands or favorite albums things that you really got into as you've grown as a musician and someone who likes music well as a wee little lad I pretty much only listened to Weird Al until I was like <laughs> nice. ninth, ninth grade, and then I, you know, got into the Green Day, the Nirvana, the kind of common, I'm just out of middle school, things you listen to. Started getting to Jimi Hendrix, and I started playing guitar, and at some point, someone showed me Iron Maiden, and, <laughs> and for some reason, it like resonated with me on this level, and I just it's started Ar- being this It's metal. Iron Maiden. Yeah. It, it, yeah, they're, 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 the ga- they're the You're gateway the metal. You're not drug or band yeah um and from then i whole you know one of this crazy metal thing for a pretty long time and i wanted to be a shredder <laughs> you know uh which thankfully i didn't do because that's still kind of passe um <laughs> not that there's money in jazz either but i went to school for jazz and obviously went down that rabbit hole and then by the end of it you know my mind kind of got really opened up to all kinds of different music and I kind of stopped, you know, having all these prejudices up against really anything. Like, I would, I started to listen to things with a very, what can I gain from this? What can I like about this instead of, what do I dislike about this? That's, I think, an important mentality to have. I mean, I think all three of us would agree that going into a lot of genres that one or the other brought, in the beginning we were very biased. When I brought a lot of 90s alternative, they were like, oh, it's 90s, whatever. But they started finding things in it. Or when John would bring punk, there were moments of great distress for all of us, or some of us. Or even (laughs) Steve. Like, Steve brought us Godsticks, which is a prog record through and through. And I had really no experience with prog. It ended up being one of my favorite records ever, honestly. And... I would have never gained that just based on a bias. And I think hitting that college age and beyond, 
if you're a fan of music, a legitimate fan of music, yeah. you find that moment where you yeah. open your mind. Because otherwise it's impossible to continue to create or listen or enjoy. That's what I meant about the, the sort of parabolic experience that we've had here on the podcast. Coming in as egotistical nobodies who knew nothing really but thought we did, which is the signifying uh, trait of, of teenagerhood. Yeah. But... um. But then, of course, you reach that point where all of it just kind of like drifts away and, and you become more accepting of your surroundings. And, and that's when I think you are at your most impressionable. You soak up as much knowledge as you can. And then, well, some of us reach the other end of that parabolic shift. And then all of a sudden we're, we're know-it-alls who actually may or may not know it all. But that's usually what you want to avoid. You want to ideally hope that your, your, your life will be a, an exponential growth and you'll constantly just keep that curved and soak up as much knowledge as possible but it leaves you as open as possible and that's that's the aim here that's what we encourage others to do and that's why i brought you on because this was apparent and this would probably be mentioned uh i did once know you we went to school together we did in fact, yes go to school we went to the same college um i didn't know you that well though you were just in the music department but it was a small enough music department that you were there you were around i don't know i i knew you well enough that i i felt confident in asking you to like like jump onto this yeah. project and uh it helped the fact that you were not just a musician, but you were also a writer. That's another little part of your life that should be mentioned, because, of course, you're a writer here for Crash Chords, and you do writing in other capacity. You're a copywriter, correct? Yes, yes I am. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. It is important. Uh, I mean, I'm not crazy about it. It's copywriting. It's advertising. But, uh, you know, I write about various <laughs> industries here and there, website copy, you know, generic SEO kind of articles, but... I always look for more things to do, so I might be writing about something interesting here and there, but never, you know, it's hard to put a pin on what exactly I'm writing about or doing. Well, the the essential thing about a copywriter is they have to have a certain turn of phrase, and in my yes. correspondence with you, that turn of phrase was apparent. Well, so, thank you. There you are. Well, well it, it helps that you're also writing about a plethora of topics oh, as, yeah. as far as copywriting goes, because, well, I, I know a little bit about it, though obviously I'm not versed. You get handed a lot of oddballs. Oh yeah, it's a, it's amazing what you learn to write about. Like I have written so much about storage facilities; it's incredible. Like, <laughs> which sounds it's as boring as you might think it is, but you, you know, will store your stuff. Believe it. Yeah, I've I've written tens have, of thousands of words. We have dollies and 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 walk-in spaces and interior lighting. Oh yeah, and climate controlled units, it's out of control. Ten by ten, climate twenty control, by twenty, you ideal, name it. Okay, I deal in the hobby industry, climate control can be a very important factor. Uh, I've already touched on this, believe me. <laughs> if you can think about it, I've ridden it. He's at that ego part of the power. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but bringing it back to writing, also the first article you wrote for us, which was you know, very in-depth, but also very unique to your voice, the Talking yeah. Points article that you'd done. The funny thing about that record is that the controversy that you brought up in that record... I heard on NPR within the same week. Oh, I'm not surprised. Wow. Yeah. And it's just pretty funny to me because... But what, what I like... I mean, it was a, a spoken article. Like, they played clips of the album, and they said the same yeah. thing that you had mentioned in the, rec in the ar article. But what's interesting about your article is that it's still very uniquely your voice. And now hearing and talking with you at length, I get a sense of it yeah. even more. So obviously you have a background with jazz because you went to school for it. Yeah. And is that why you really want to write about that record or was the controversy a big part of it too? It was it was a controversy. Like with, uh, you know, how Steve, I was talking on Facebook and Steve saw me and there was this whole back and forth. Sometimes when I see people saying certain things, like especially about music, I'm like, why are you... You're not thinking about this clearly, and I just feel the need to just. That's why interject. I hopped in there. You hopped yeah. in there. I hopped in. It was only a mutual friend, yeah. and somehow it was like, "You really want to be that guy? We're just like troll the internet." No, no. I, I, I have, I have more words than than just simple yeah. trolling status it's, on this. Because it's not about me being right. It's about it just frustrates me when you know two sides are arguing, and I'm saying thinking like, "But you're missing this, and you're missing that." So you should both maybe. You know, consolidate. Repeat yeah, it. exactly. So with that article, I saw so many people ranting and rambling about this and saying they're not, you know, they're not creative. And it's like you, you just have the facts wrong. They are creative. They've proven themselves before. So I wanted to just kind of here's a public service announcement. Oh, I feel like creativity it's also... is, is a matter of subjectivity, but also creativity is 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 sometimes not. Creativity is whatever you create while you were created. Right. Degrees of of which you find it to be creative is 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 variable. Yeah, so, but some but, pieces are just self evident. Yeah, 
Well, it's also, it's be, I always feel that music is beyond saying that sucks. That yeah. sucks is not a statement that describes music. That's a statement that describes you. You suck. Like, <laughs> if, you, if you have a valid opinion about something, and, and valid, I mean, is also a word that's almost empty. But if you have an opinion about music, explain it. Don't just say, this sucks. Like I said a few weeks ago, it's like Nickelback doesn't suck because you think they suck. They suck because they are repetitive and like they use the same riffs. Like there are reasons you can say something yeah. isn't good to you, but you have to elaborate. It's like if you have a list behind you, you can probably get away with saying something without without people jumping down your throat. They're still going to jump down your throat, yes. but you know, at least at least you thought it through. Yeah, it's Socratic method right at its core. You say something, defend it. You're going to be attacked for it, especially if you're on the internet. Uh, here there be monsters. You have to have a little bit of knowledge before you say something. Preferably a lot of bit, bit of knowledge before you say something. Um, that's why I'm very thankful that you're joining us because, well, I don't know jazz. No, that's, <laughs> Matt that's don't fair. really know jazz. I know Steve knows some jazz. I know some jazz, but you, you, you fill out the corner well. And oh, frankly, jazz and Flying Lotus, while you're already bringing a very interesting repertoire to to the website because well jazz and flying load there you go well, that's, no. that's two very misunderstood areas of music that is that is very true is going very back true. to one more thing and this is kind of important uh, linking music and writing together is if you're going to talk about defending def- about defending a a work defending any aspect of creativity I, I I it's one of those instances where I don't think the brevity comes to your strength. I don't yeah. think that it is a strength. I don't think brevity is a is a is a, a tenet of the internet. I think it's a flaw of the internet. Oh yeah. I mean that's the the quintessential YouTube comment is when pe- people mm-hmm. show up and they think they are being punchy, and then they usually wind up being very very non thorough and and offensive at the same time because. Issues are complicated. You need to address them in a larger capacity than simply your one-liner that you think is going to turn everybody's head or bring them on your side. Normally, that's that's a flaw. So, yeah, I like elaboration. And that's another reason why you're here. While we're talking about your writing, um, I'm curious if you have any goals or ideas. I mean, obviously, when I set out, when I first started this website on my own ages ago before it became a group project, it was mostly, there was a lot of brevity, actually. Um and Steve and John both helped me learn to elaborate and create longer form stuff. This should be brevity we challenge in, you. This should we be brevity in some you. things, but like for a copywriting perspective, that's a perfect no, need no, for course. brevity. But and you know. I was creating a lot of short form articles and I learned to expand. Um but writing is a like I can legitimately list myself as a writer. Yeah. And that's not something I ever thought about in college or high school because I hated writing because I hated writing English in an English class or, you know, in history class because I found something I like writing about. Do you have, uh, not necessarily grand goals, it sounds so superfluous, but do you have any goals for the website with stuff you'd like to contribute, you'd like us to read about, you'd like to write about? Uh, you know, maybe not super specifically, but I kind of realized just from seeing the people who've, reached out back to you guys or just in general the people you get on the show that what's nice about this kind of the the site and the community you've built around it is that it's kind of it's smaller it's you can still relate to it and other people can relate back to you so if i review an album say by someone i found on bandcamp uh which i've been listening to these random artists that i'm like oh cool album but you know 800 people follow this guy so no one really knows him but i could write the album tell the guy i wrote uh, I reviewed it, and then he will actually talk to me, and yeah. you know that will help the site too. And that's kind of, I think, a good way to go about things. There's been a lot mutually of mutually aiding artists, yeah. and 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 this as a product. Well, because also the reality is, if like we've reviewed big albums mostly because we just want to be part of the oh, yeah. noise, and, and wrong sometimes wrong. we just love Weezer a lot. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is, if Rolling Stones come out with a new record tomorrow and Pitchfork does a review, no one's reading our review over Pitchfork. Yeah, they might, yeah. like close friends might, but the masses won't. Yeah, and so that's why when we do big albums on the podcast, it's more about what we take from it and where we think it fits than the final word. And that's why I like reaching out to a lot of the nerdcore artists I have is because that's a community that very much is built within itself and the artists and the fans are very close-knit and so you can get a lot of feedback back and forth. There's an artist named Sulphur who we'll come back to later when we wrap up. He's now shared the interview I did with him on autographs four times on his 
Facebook page, wow. separate times, yeah. because he wants to bring it back to us because he feels like we did him a service by yeah. doing something valuable, and I think his music is doing a service. So it's a it's a very scratch your back, I'll yeah. you know scratch mine main, kind of thing. The main thing I think is, is of course keeping it well rounded. I mean, when you mentioned we we do big artists, a lot of times is also to keep to keep it grounded, to keep the discussion grounded because there's this runaway train surrounding the big names where people are just it, it becomes that blind idolization of something that you know when you compare it against the newer, fresher stuff out there, like for instance the stuff on Bandcamp, you know that. A lot of times, the, the the younger generation has learned. They've learned. They've picked up on different sources. In many ways, the only thing that holds them back is just, well, that simply they haven't found their door. And every artist needs their door. So addressing larger artists isn't to take them down a peg. Yeah. It's to keep everything on an even playing field. They are what they are. So are the guys on Bandcamp. So when you look at what perhaps newer albums from bands who've been around for 20, 30 years are, and then you consider the fresher artists, you know, play the game. Don't just go with the flow. Don't just go with, say, what Pitchfork Magazine says or what Rolling Stone says. You know, think about it yourself. This whole product is not, this whole project is not about about spewing our views. It's really about to cover as many bases as possible to encourage listeners to do the same on their own, on their own dime. And I think that's also another thing why I'm actually truly grateful for you to want to be a part of this is because the more voices we have within our structure, the the more we can reach. Like, yeah, also, it's just your friends are now a separate audience that with a little crossover, we don't really reach. Yeah. And that now we can. And your writing is great. Your voice, you. I like the voice that you have because... Some of us tend to write more seriously and analytically. Some of us tend to write more from the heart. But we cross over and we've learned from each other. But the reality is we still have this underlying... You're in the middle, John. That's why I didn't point to you. Okay. <laughs> but the, the, I got called out. The, the re, but the reality is, is our voices still kind of run together now because we've worked together so much that we, we do play off each other. Yeah. And so a fresh voice means another fresh perspective that we can also continue to assimilate essentially like the Borg. Whoa. That's, that's scary. There. Creepy. But, yeah. um, but thank right you here. for bringing us this record. Thank you for being on the show. Thank Have, you. With all of your endeavors in Milwaukee, please stay in touch. Continue to write fantastic articles for us. I shall. And uh, don't go anywhere, because you're not allowed yet, because <laughs> you're going to read our sign-off, but I want to get into wrapping up the show. All right. So um, uh, we've had this kind of lucky stint of having actual fans comment. I don't know if you've listened to a lot of the older episodes, but we've had... Steve, for a long time, I think it was my idea, but I don't remember. It might have been Steve's, but essentially we came up with the idea, hey, wouldn't it be funny because we get all these spam comments on the website to treat them like fan comments? Oh, I recall I that, was, that was my idea. It was, I stay out of this because I didn't want to be a part of it. I thought it was funny because you get all the WordPress comments and these just like <coughs> massive exclamation, spam Exclamation, exclamation, question mark, exclamation, question mark, And question so Biagra, the silliness Biagra, Biagra, Biagra. got perpetuated as Steve found more and more ridiculous ones where it actually really did become funny. And... But we've had this great run in the new year of having actual fans comment on the site, which is a sign of growth. We read a horrifically mean one very recently. I, I, I really enjoyed that. that. I still laugh at that comment. And so, a real person. He as I mentioned him last week, I had, I had reached out to um, Insane Ian, who is a, a parody artist, a rapper. He works a lot in the nerdcore field and is friends and fan of a lot of the artists that I've already reviewed. He's He knows Shea for the Dark Lord, had heard me on the Epic Piecast mentioned a few times, and when I was actually a guest, he's like, oh, I should probably check this out now. And so he's raised out to me a few times, and on my recent interview with Sulphur, I got on a tangent with Sulphur about the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, because who doesn't? And I mentioned <laughs> Luigi, who's on the show, the actual live-action actor who played across from Captain Lou Albano, who played Mario, and I couldn't remember the actor's name. And... So he responded with some information about that actor and some other information just about the interviewing and and everything else. So, Steve, please read Insane Ian's comment. On the Sulphur article. I love your interview style, Matt. Very personable. Makes for a great listen. Listening to your interview with Sulphur, the actor who played Luigi was Danny Wells, who sadly passed away in 2013. Ironically, shortly around the same time, the voice actor for Tales passed. Not a good year for sidekicks. It's like trying to remember the name of the other guy in Wham! or the guy on Bosom Buddies who wasn't Tom Hanks. Peter Scolari? Am I showing my age? Also, Thor Thorvaldson. Is that actually he, Thor Thorvaldson? His That's his name. Awesome Scandinavian name ever. Yeah. Thor Thorvaldson did the cover to my most recent album. His artwork is amazing, and between my album Beefies, Kills, and Mega Rans this year, he's been busy as hell. 
Thor Thorvaldson is an actual artist who's worked with all of those artists who'd, who'd been uh, mentioned, and Sulfur also has a an uh, album called uh, Odin's Son, which is about <laughs> Thor. It's a whole EP about Thor and has quotes from the, the movie, and the artwork was done by Wait, Thor first, Thorvaldson. The first one or the second one? First one. Oh, okay, because the second one was actually a lot better. Yeah, but there were some memorable quotes in the first one. Yeah, there was, but it was, it's still... But it was mostly about Thor. The, the album it was mostly was... about Loki. No, I'm saying the album was mostly about Thor. He just used the movie quotes, because that that's what we're out. That was representation of the movie, then. I'm not arguing that. Settle down, settle down. Oh, you're so easy to troll. Anyway, so thank you, Ian, for your comment. Um, continue to comment on the site. We'll keep reading them. Um, but thank you for also the compliment. I try and keep the conversations fairly casual because it's. I think it's more, it's very easy to be like, what do you like? What did you do? What influenced you? And it's harder to kind of try and get inside the artist's head yeah, and yeah. actually next get slide. to know them. <laughs> yeah, pretty much next slide. Getting to know the artist as a person is a lot more fun, and I really, uh, I really enjoy that. <clears throat> Next week, we are having a guest as well. We have double-stacked our guests this month as well, wow. um, like we did back in October. We have the return of Painless Parker, a member of the Wasties and a badass musician in his own right, is bringing us an album next week. He's also going to play some live tracks for us. Um, the album is called Haven't Got the Blues Yet, and it's by Luden Wainwright III. Um, it's an album that came out in 2014. Um, I've not heard of the artist, but he is... Uh, it sounds really cool. It's interesting. And um, so, yeah. So, yeah, look for that next week. And for the complete anthology of Painless Parker's appearances, look back to episode 63, in which we reviewed uh, Leaving Eden by Carolina Chocolate Drops. And then the episode when he was on with the Wasties was? Episode 44, An Evening with the Wasties. So, you can check him out there. Now, um, as we sign off, like we always do, I'm going to have Tony read out our sign off and uh, take us out this week. Music is life, and life is good. If you enjoyed this and other album analyses, topics, and guests, please subscribe to the Crash Chords Podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. For more media, also subscribe to Matt's one-on-one interview series, Crash Chords Autographs. To receive emails on all new content, subscribe at the top of our homepage. Also receive updates by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. And remember, keep the discussion going, because music is life, and life is good. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the comment board below each post. Otherwise, email us directly at admin at crashchords.com.